Thank you. We will now turn to Group 7 on publishing and reporting restrictions. I call Amendment 25 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 49, 26, 27 and 38. I call on the Minister to move Amendment 25 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I have lodged Amendments 26 and 27 to remove the changes that affect reporting restrictions that were originally in the Bill. I am, however, aware that the Committee agreed Sections 12 and 13 on reporting restrictions as amended at Stage 2. In recent weeks, I have been approached by MSPs and representatives of the media expressing concerns about these sections of the Bill, and I know that some members have been keen to consider amendments to remove these sections at Stage 3. Despite the two public consultations on the Bill's proposals, it is clear from the correspondence I have received and conversations I have had that the full implications of these matters were not fully appreciated by stakeholders and members at that stage. I have always been clear that we want this legislation to be fully considered and informed by a broad range of views from people who would be affected by the provisions. In addition, the Scottish Government fully recognises the key role that an open media plays in a functioning democracy. Given the short time that was available before Stage 3 deadlines, it was impossible to give these sections of the Bill the further in-depth engagement they required. And I have decided that the most prudent course of action is to lodge Stage 3 amendments to remove those provisions from the Bill to enable these matters to be considered further out with this Bill. And that is what Amendments 25, 26, 27 and 38 seek to do. However, I have also been profoundly struck by the distress and adverse consequences that can be experienced by accused persons, their families and witnesses and victims of crime and their families as a result of press and social media coverage. It is important that we get this right. I am committed to ensuring that we build a robust body of evidence in order to inform any future legislation on these matters. I will work with those who would be impacted by developments to consider how best to ensure that all issues that arise in the area of press coverage are covered, and I will write to the committee with an update on this work in the coming months. Moving to Mr Whitfield's Amendment 49, I do not agree that it is necessary in relation to the Scottish Minister's existing power under Section 1824 of the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011 to dispense with or relax children's hearings publishing restrictions in the interests of justice. Section 1824 will only be used in emergency situations where there is the need for a media alert to find a child due to concerns for their welfare and the children's hearing can already contact the Scottish ministers to advise of any situations where this power might be required without the need for a further power. I would ask the member not to move this amendment. I move amendments 25, 26, 27 and 38. Thank you, Minister. I call on Martin Whitfield to speak to Amendment 49 and other amendments in the group. Mr Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And um, can I welcome the approach that the Minister has taken with regard to this? Because I think all of those who have in any way been involved um, in and around the situation of, of the discussion over the publishing and reporting restrictions, and I'll use those terms to cover as much of, as possible, can only be absolutely aware of, of the pain, the discomfort and the anguish that has been occasioned. Um, I can reassure the, the, the Minister and indeed the Chamber that the purposes of my amendment was to allow me to give an input in respect of this matter because I was unsure um, at the time of, 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 of drafting and lodging what the approach was going to be, although I would like to take the opportunity to thank those who assisted with what was an incredibly difficult amendment to draft, given that the power with regard to the publishing restrictions rests with ministers, which may indeed come as a surprise um, to some people both in and outside of this chamber. I, I would like to um, ask the minister, um, either as an, in, an intervention or indeed winding up, to deal with just a couple of matters. The first is in respect of the letter of the 28th of March that was sent to the Convener of the Education, Children and Young People's Committee, much of which has been articulated in the Minister's submission just now, and in particular um, the surprise um, that seems to have been occasioned by the nature of the amendments and changes that were um, proposed. And, you know, I think the Government if they were aware, should have made more 
with regard to the substantial changes that were being proposed, rather than relying on those outside of the place to discover it. Um, and, and I must compliment the work of victims and indeed those that advocate on their behalf for raising this. I, I, I do think it came very late in the day, and I think it is um, unfair, um, as the letter indicates, that it seems to have been stakeholders and members that were at, at fault with that. The other challenge that we have is where this and how this is going to be rectified, because it is going to require legislation. There was a stage one bill passed yesterday that could be a vehicle, but for the fact that possibly public consultation has not taken place sufficiently enough for the government to be in a position to articulate what their answer is to this. So if it is not that legislation, does the Minister have in mind a legislation that could solve this problem before the end of this session um, of the Parliament? And my second point is in relation to the round table, which you know, I think was incredibly welcome at the time. Um, but I think, it, and it was interesting that the Minister spoke of continuing to write to the committee and the work that the Education Committee does on this. When I look at those who were invited to participate in the round table, um, no opposition education spokespeople were um, invited to attend. And actually, I think one of the challenges that the reason that this has cut so deep and caused so much anguish is actually there is an understanding amongst um, people who work extensively with children, the, the challenge that these sort of events have on families. Um, and I think that there has to be an acceptance that there is a valuable input available. I'm more than happy. Yes. Ruth McGuire. I'm grateful to Martin Whitfield for giving way. I'm just interested in what he's saying there about education spokespeople and the roundtable. And you're right, it was a lot of justice um, spokespeople who were there. Would he agree with me that in an issue as difficult as this, what we need are people who are going to really champion children? Because it is, it's going to be, it's, it, it's a difficult thing to do this, but we need to just keep laser focused on children. Martin Whitfield. I absolutely welcome that intervention. I couldn't agree more and, and very articulately put, because... It is something that specifically affects young people and the family that surround them. And the circumstances are incredibly difficult, which is why I welcome the very sensitive nature that the Minister has taken with regard to this. But I would like an, a reassurance from the government that if this matter passes to legislation that will sit with justice, how are the experiences that sit both within this chamber and outside from the point of view of young people that we've just so heard, going to take the right level of importance, and that I know who sits next to the, the Minister for this. And um, it is not a got you question or anything. This is too important to make a mistake, but it will need primary legislation. It will need proper work. It will absolutely need the involvement of young people and indeed families of young people on this. Um, so I welcome um, some uh, answers, comments as far as the Minister is able to go today. And on that point, I thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whitfield. I call Ros McCall. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, we're happy to support all the amendments in this group concerning reporting restrictions uh, which would remove sections 12 and 13 from the Bill entirely. Uh, the positions of various members and stakeholders were well articulated at stage two, with pertinent points being raised by my colleague uh, Liam Kerr, also by uh, Willie Rennie. And I'm not going to labour the, the point too much on that. I think it was my colleague Liam Kerr who suggested that a possible solution might be to uh, remove the sections and have a round table and bring back provisions in a for, uh, formal format. And I echo the comments that have been made by Mr Whitfield and um, Ms Maguire regarding the fact that children's voices should be uh, well and loud and clear on that process. So we appreciate the Scottish, gov the Scottish Government's acceptance of the Scottish Conservative concerns and that of other parties and stakeholders. And just to repeat, we will be uh, supporting the removal of sections 12 and 13. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McCall. I call Willie Rennie. We will support the Minister's uh, amendments, but we're not happy about it. Um, the Minister's amendments in this group do represent an abrupt change at stage three. Now, I understand the reasons. I've read the letter. I get the arguments that are being made. But, however, it is concerning that it's taken to this stage um, for the issues to be resolved. And it does receive, leave unresolved issues as well. Now, the Children's Commissioner has made it clear that they can't support the amendments. And Victim Support Scotland have also expressed their concern. 
The sections of the Bill which the Minister is seeking to remove dealt with important human rights protections, which children, including subject children, victims and witnesses, are being concerned with. So, much as to the points that Martin Whitfield was raising, legislative op opportunities are very rare, and my concern is that this will drift for some time, that the impetus that has been received through this legislative process will be lost. So we need some timescales, and I know the Minister is reluctant normally to give timescales, but we do need to have timescales, if nothing else, to hold the Parliament to account to itself to deliver this. I would like to know what the legislative vehicle could be, how long it will take, and what consult cons consultative process there will be involved to make sure that children are at the heart of this. As others have said, that it should not just be a justice process, it needs to be an education process as well. So we will support the amendments in this group, if a bit reluctantly. Thank you, Mr Rennie. And I call Liam Kerr. Very grateful, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak in support of the Government's amendments at 26 and 27, which remove sections 12 and 13, covering restrictions on reporting of suspected offences and proceedings from the Bill. Presiding Officer, at stage two, I specifically suggested these sections were overbroad, unworkable, and a serious restriction on media freedoms. I flagged that as a result, they may be non-compliant with the ECHR, and thus potentially put the operation of any final act at risk. A number of stakeholders also raised this in great detail with the Minister, but following stage two, the provisions remained. Now, to the Minister's credit, she engaged with me and other stakeholders following stage two, before acknowledging in a letter to the Committee that these sections need further in-depth engagement, as the matters that we raised were not fully appreciated by stakeholders and members. Indeed, they weren't, presiding officer. I specifically asked the minister at stage two, does the minister have any concerns that the amendments could restrict press freedom? To which he replied, quote, no. If there was any danger of that being the case, I would not be taking forward the amendments in their current form. So no, I do not have any such concerns. She also went on to tell me in a direct answer to my question that she had specific legal advice on, quote, each of the Bill's provisions, which helped her to arrive at those conclusions. Now, having latterly recognised the issues and seeking to amend them out, I understand there may be the possibility of modified provisions reappearing in another Bill. And looking back at stage two, I proposed exactly that as a solution to give Parliament an opportunity for full scrutiny. Now, President Officer, I am delighted that the force of my arguments eventually cut through, but leaving aside for another time more general considerations about legislative scrutiny, I do think it's important to flag this issue, this history, to Parliament, such that if provisions such as these do reappear before a future committee in a bill, members are alive to, and this time, fully appreciate them and perhaps ask to see the legal advice in order that we do not find ourselves in this situation again. So, presiding officer, the right decision has been reached by the minister and we will vote for amendments 26 and 27. But I must say, I find it very concerning that it took until stage three to get to this point. Thank you, Mr Kerr. And I call the minister. Thank you, President Officer. I um, will just briefly respond to a couple of the points that have been raised in this debate. I, in, in relation to Martin Whitfield's comments around more could have been done at an earlier point, I mean, I agree to that, to, with that to a certain extent. I think more could have been done to perhaps flag this to stakeholders prior to this point. But I, I equally, I don't agree that it should always be on the government's back to, to flag these, these things. And just in relation to Liam Kerr's comments, you know, at stage two, I had not had the interaction or the concerns brought to me from the press um, around these amendments. 
Now, in terms of other avenues, there may well be a, fi a Year 5 bill that could, for example, be an avenue for this. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not able to confirm that at this point, but of course I'll, I'll be keeping members and Parliament updated on this. Because remember, of course, we've got other legislative changes in this space that will be required, for example, children's hearings redesign. So that will be something that, that will be going forward. And I'll take members' views or suggestions on the process going forward for this. I want to be very, very clear that, in my eyes, young people should absolutely be at the core of this. We need to understand the impact that this has on our young people. So all in all, I think, although for some perhaps different reasons, I think we're all in agreement here um, and we'll, we'll move forward with this as such. And I'll move the amendments. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 49 in the name of Martin Whitfield, already debated with Amendment 25. Martin Whitfield, to move or not move? Not move. Not moved. I call Amendment 50 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 41. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. The question, uh, sorry, I call Amendment 51 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 41. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 52 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 41. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Not moved and happy to group them if that's helpful. Not moved. I'll, I'll just um, read out the last two, if I may, uh, as we've started in the spaces. I call Amendment 53 in the name of Russell Finlay, uh, already debated with Amendment 41. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Moved. Not moved. <laughs> Uh, I now call Amendment 57 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with Amendment 42. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? It moved, President Officer. Moved. The question is that Amendment 57 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 57 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes, 48. No, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We will now turn to Group 8 on Children's Hearing System Victims' Views. I call Amendment 58 in the name of Martin Whitfield, grouped with Amendment 68. Martin, and I call on Martin Whitfield to move Amendment 58 and to speak to both amendments in the group. Mr Whitfield. I am very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And this section deals with the, the children's hearing, and in particular from the victims' point of views. The purposes of amendment 58 is to give the government the opportunity um, to allow for uh, the views of the victim that would add to the existing provisions while it makes its rules. So it doesn't require but allows the opportunity so that, as we've heard in um, earlier amendments that have been successful where the operation is right to do so, 
there should be the opportunity for the victim's views to be heard. The procedures that exist within the children's hearing system are challenging for any young person to be involved in. But when you are the young person who has been the victim of events, it can be doubly hard because you can feel alone, you can feel stuck at the side. And actually, as we've, or as I articulated in earlier amendments, um, the system needs to be tailored towards listening and understanding the young people that come in front of them because their needs, their expectations, their ways of communicating successfully are different to those of adults. And this allows for an opportunity for the government to encompass that and, where appropriate, allow for the views of the victim um, to be put forward to the children's hearing so that it can form part of the evidence that's articulated in the decisions that are made that not just affect the young person who has been brought before children's hearing, but also those like the victim who surround it. I am grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whitfield. Um, I call uh, Russell Finlay to speak to Amendment uh, 68 and other amendments in the group. Mr Finlay. Thank you, uh, President Officer. A lack of transparency in the justice system and poor communication with victims are recurring themes, and we are seeing some serious criminal cases being increasingly referred to the children's panel, and that will inevitably increase by raising the age from 16 to 18. And of course, no one wants to unduly criminalise young people, but it would be irresponsible to overlook the rights, interests and welfare of victims who are very often also young people. And I've spoken to victims of all ages who have suffered great distress when they discover that the young person who committed a crime against them will not go to court. Officer, this bill will actually remove existing rights that some victims are already entitled to, specifically those harmed by 16 and 17 year olds will no longer have certain rights that they would have had if their case went to a criminal court. And that's where my amendment number 68 is relevant. This will give victims a voice. Now, my colleague Liam Kerr spoke to one of my stage two amendments which was numbered 206. This sought to do something similar, but was unsuccessful in large part due to legal technicalities. <clears throat> in short, I had then tried to use victim impact statements as a vehicle for this, but these are not transferable from a court to a panel context. So Amendment 68 would instead allow victims to make a personal statement to the children's panel. The principal reporter would be required to provide any victim with the opportunity to make a statement explaining how the offence has affected them. Now, if the government is if intent in effectively downgrading some crimes by diverting them from courts to children's panel, they must pay heed to victims. A victim's suffering is not in any way lessened because someone in the system decides the perpetrator is too young to face criminal justice consequences. Now, yesterday at stage one debate in the government's uh, victims bill, much of that was about improving the experience of victims and witnesses. And victims cannot be forgotten in this legislation. Amendment 68 is supported by Victim Support Scotland who say, we believe this amendment is vital to ensuring the gravity of the offence is understood and would ensure crime victims have a voice in decisions which will significantly impact them. This would be in line with availability of victim impact statements in the criminal justice system. Now, my previous stage two amendment won support from Labour and indeed Willie Rennie of the Lib Dems, and one SNP member even abstained. And I sincerely hope that they, and indeed the Minister, can be persuaded by this new and improved attempt to allow victims to be heard. Um, turning to Martin Whitfield's amendment, we support that. It's similar in its purpose and intent to what our, our amendment does. But I do believe that ours is a little bit more detailed in how that can be achieved. I want to also just quickly address that Scottish Women's Aid um, in their briefing documents say they do not support uh, this um, amendment, however they support the intention behind it. But upon reading their uh, submission, I am not entirely sure if they have particularly understood that this is about 
uh, victims of all ages. It's not, it's not exclusively about victims who are also children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I now call Willie Rennie. I do wish sometimes that Russell Finlay wouldn't use the loaded language that he does in some occasions about downgrading some crimes. That's not the intention um, of this whole bill. But I do recognise the arguments that have made, been made by Victim Support Scotland in support of his Amendment 68 on allowing victims to make a personal statement. However, the Children's Commissioner is pretty clear. Uh, yes, certainly. Russell Finlay. I, I, I'm not going to apologise for the use of language. I mean, this week I was speaking to the family of a young man who was subject to the most horrific homophobic attack, and this particular case is being directed towards the children's panel. And that family and that child firmly believe that this has been downgraded, and that's the reality in the streets out there. Willie Rooney. But I just say that Mr Finlay does have, a, have an, a monopoly on the caring for people who are victims. It's important that we get the right to make sure that we don't have repeat offences in future. So the Children's Commissioner is clear. They've said that it risks creating an expectation from victims that the statement would influence the decision of the panel, which simply can't be done within the Kilbrandon principles. And Scottish Women's Aid, that Russell Finlay has already referred to, also have reservations about the statement would fit in with the hearing system. They support developing a child-friendly, trauma-informed approach that reflects the Bairnshoos. We need to, an approach which ensures that child victims do not need to retell their story multiple times to multiple professionals and which considers the age and stage of the children involved. So therefore we can't support Amendment 60. Uh, yes, certainly. Michelle Thompson. Giving way. I just wanted to make clear that my understanding and having read uh, uh, about this quite extensively as well is the opportunity but not the obligation. So he makes an absolutely fair point about the re-traumatisation of retelling a story. But if that is what a victim wishes to do and feels very strongly about, then it's the opportunity, but not the obligation. Willie Rennie. It's why I support uh, Amendment 58, because I think it creates the provision for views and concerns to be expressed through the system, rather than replicating a system that's already in the criminal justice system around about victim notifications, victim impact statements, which I don't think um, are appropriate for the Cobrandon principle. So I accept her point, but I think there's a better way of doing it with Martin Whitfield's approach, which is around about the making sure that there are procedures and the development of procedures and rules to allow for those views and impacts to be reflected in the system, which I think probably reflects current practice um, within the current arrangements. So that's why I would support 58, but not 68. Thank you. And I call the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. These amendments appear to place victim impact type measures directly into decision making in the children's hearing system, and to do so would be potentially re traumatising and misleading for victims. And in addition, the amendments fundamentally misconstrue the hearing system welfare based approach and the focus of decision making. Now, again, I'm quite disappointed by Russell Findlay's tone. I don't agree that we are downgrading crimes by referring to the children's hearing system. We must remember that the Lord Advocate retains responsibility and independence for prosecutor prosecutorial decisions. Any child referred to a hearing on offence grounds will have been diverted to the reporter following a joint referral discussion in line with the Lord Advocate's guidelines and prosecution policy. There will therefore already have been independent professional consideration on whether the child's offending merits a prosecutorial or a welfare-based approach. Similarly, a court will not remit a case to a children's hearing for disposable for disposal where a criminal justice sanction rather than a welfare-based disposal is the most appropriate. Given the application of the welfare approach in this context, it would not normally be appropriate to veer back towards a criminal justice system approach <laughs> as, opposed, as proposed by the amendments. A hearing should not routinely be required to gather the views of victims nor to take their views into account in making their decision. The hearing's focus must be through the lens of considering what compulsory measures are necessary to safeguard and promote the referred child's welfare, except for very clear and limited public safety requirements. In so doing, it can include any measure necessary to prevent the child from causing any further harm to others. 
Under procedural rules, it is already open to the hearing to require the reporter to obtain any report from any person which the children's hearing considers would be relevant to any matter that the hearing will determine. The, ne the necessity of any report like that is best left with the independent tribunal in individual cases. In prosecuted offence cases where a person has been given the opportunity to give a witness statement, the court will already have access to that in making their earlier decision on whether to remit the case to a hearing for a disposable. To change the ethos of the hearing system in the manner proposed by Amendment 58 and 68 would introduce incoherence and unfairness. It would not be fair to victims to indicate to them that they could expect to influence a more intrusive or retrib retributive response to a child from the hearing. That would not happen. Imposing further expectations and potentially reintroducing trauma to them would require strong justification. And as I have explained, I find no, just, no such justification here. In addition, it would be difficult in practice in the context of a children's hearing to be able to seek views of a victim without causing to delay to the progress of the child's case, taking the focus away from swift decisions to safeguard and promote the welfare of the referred child and to promote public safety. In the same way, for Amendment 68, it would not be appropriate for the principal reporter to be required to give a victim the opportunity to provide a personal statement where a child's case has been remitted by the court for disposal. It would not be relevant for the hearing's decision. In exceptional cases where a hearing may decide that further imp information, including from a victim, is needed in the form of a report, I will take the intervention. Russell Finlay. I understand it correctly. Is the Minister saying that it would not be, the phrase was, it would not be relevant to hear from a crime victim in that context? Minister. If Mr Finlay had let me finish, I'm saying in exceptional cases where a hearing may decide that further information, including from the victim, is needed in the form of a report, they can already secure that. Wholesale prescription of that approach would be inappropriate. The government cannot, therefore, accept these amendments. Thank you. And I call Martin Whitfield to wind up press the withdrawal amendment 58. Mr Whitfield. Um, I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm slightly disappointed at the government's approach to this because the amendment isn't a requirement. The amendment allows for the provision of, which is something that the Minister has articulated can exist if internally within the panel it is being sought. This would put that into guidance so that there would be reassurance not just across this Parliament but across Scotland that actually there isn't a postcode lottery um, in relation to the children's hearing, but there is a basic formula in the system that people can rely on, people can um, look to, to ensure they understand what's happening. So under the circumstances, I will push Amendment 58. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 58 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a vote and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Shirley Ann Somerville. Thank you, President Officer. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Somerville. I'll make sure that is recorded.
And the result of the vote on amendment number 58 in the name of Martin Whitfield is yes, 48, no, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We turn now to group 9, legal aid. I call amendment 54 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, uh, grouped with amendments 55 and 56. Pam Duncan Glancy to move amendment 54 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. As I've set out already, Scottish Labour have paid close attention to recommendations of various reviews, including that, again, I say, um, from Sheriff Mackey, whilst forming our approach to the bill. The report highlighted, Mr Mackey's report highlighted the importance of children being fully informed of their right to legal representation and the need to revisit how the right to legal support is upheld, both things I am supportive of and seek to move towards via the amendments in this group today. Children entangled in the children's hearing system may come from diverse socio-economic backgrounds or difficult family circumstances. Legal aid levels the playing field by addressing inherent inequalities and ensuring that every child has the means to present their case effectively and comprehensively and understands fully the processes they are involved in. This inclusivity is aligned with the principles of justice and fairness that underpin the legal and the children's justice system. Many, including the Children's Commissioner, have consistently called for extension of legal aid to include children referred to a hearing in all circumstances, and the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has made several recommendations to this effect, most recently in their 2023 concluding observations. That is why I lodged amendments at stage two of the bill for any child referred to a hearing, including those referred on welfare grounds, to be entitled to automatic legal aid. However, the Government stated they were unwilling to broaden the scope of automatic entitlement to this extent, and so I believed it likely that returning the same amendment at stage three would fail to gather the necessary support. I do, however, remain of the view that it is absolutely essential in order to protect the rights of children and young people that any child that could either be found guilty of an offence or admit guilt to an offence should have the right on the basis of the potential impact on their life. Even in such an event that a conviction will cease to be disclosed in the future, it would remain on internal police systems and be subject to advanced disclosure checks. I believe that without amendment, this bill will fall short of the UNCRC compliance on the issue of legal aid and that automatic access is the only way to meet the procedural requirements of Article 40 and ensure that all children have access to effective legal representation free of charge. The notification method currently used is not and cannot be improved to meet this duty. Currently, only 25 per cent of children who have been referred to a children's hearing on offence grounds have a solicitor. This is in stark contrast to the figures mentioned by the Minister during Stage 2, which relate to the number of children who apply and are then granted legal aid. Whilst the number who apply and are granted is high, it is related to those children who had the knowledge that they could instruct a solicitor. 99% of applications might be granted, but if only 25% of children know that they can instruct a solicitor, then the duty under Article 40 is not met. And so Amendment 55 in my name calls for legal aid to be automatically available for all children referred on an offence ground by means of that entitlement being made clear on the face of the Bill. Amendment 56 seeks to do the same but allows the Government to introduce that entitlement via regulation as Section 28C subsection 3 of the Legal Aid Scotland Act 1986 provides for. The Government has given previous reassurance that it intends to bring those regulations, but an issue of such importance, I believe, cannot be left to good faith, and so I would like to see the commitment secured in legislation, either by support for it on the face of the Bill or support for the regulatory power to be on this Bill. Members will note that my Amendment 54 is slightly narrower in that it would only make provision for legal aid to be automatically available to any child reported to both the Procurator Fiscal and the Children's Hearing System. I do not believe this is wide enough to fully comply with children's rights. However, in the event that members may not feel they are able to support the other amendments in the group, I would make a plea that they support this one to ensure at least those children who face the possibility of being found or admitting guilt to a severe charge, which in turn is likely to have more serious and obvious consequences on the rest of their lives, have access to legal aid and the system upholds the principle of fairness and equality for them as a result. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Ms Duncan Glancy. I now call Rose McCall. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I just wanted to make a small note on, on the record for this because I note the amendments in the group which we're minded to support. 
Uh, basically, I simply believe that people who require legal assistance should be able to access it. And these amendments uh, bring us through the support offered in the form of legal aid, which we are happy to support. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Willie Rennie. Uh, we will be supporting Pam Duncan Glancy's amendments as well in this group. I'm grateful for the detailed work that she's done on this. She explored this at stage two, and the Minister presented some challenges at the time, but I don't think she really addressed the crucial point raised by both Pam Duncan Glancy and Ruth Maguire, and that is that, they, as the Children's Commissioner has said, that some children have not understood that accepting a referral on offence grounds results in a conviction on their PVG record. The Commissioner has also made it clear that an extension of legal aid to children in all circumstances is needed, and it has been included in the recommendations of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. So there's clearly an issue that needs to be solved, and I've not heard from the Government enough to convince me that the measures are in place. So because of the lack of those measures, I'll be supporting Pam Duncan Glancy's amendments. Thank you, and I call the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Some of these amendments would make children's legal aid automatically available to a child subject to children's hearing proceedings in any case where proceedings were arranged on the grounds that the child has committed an offence. I do not consider that this is necessary, as I was set out in response to similar amendments at stage two. I am very grateful for recent discussions with Ms Duncan Glancy, where we discussed concerns around cases where disclosure in later life might have an adverse impact. We also noted the pending action to mitigate that under, that under the 2020 Disclosure Act, when the independent reviewer provisions come into force. In addition, the current law does enable us to bring forward regulations to amend the Legal Aid Act to deliver reform in an appropriate way without the need for these amendments to this Bill. Having regard to existing proportionate provision for assistance for children in these circumstances, the Scottish Government considers these amendments are not necessary. Regardless of the automatic availability of children's legal aid, a child is entitled to advice and assistance for any preliminary assistance that they require in relation to a referral to a children's hearing. Although I know members have raised um, concerns around access to that, and I will get on to that later in my notes. Um, for representation at a hearing, assistance by way of representation or ABWAR is already available for every child subject to such a hearing, including those arising as a result of an offence, subject to an application to the Scottish Legal Aid, Legal Aid Board, commonly known as, known as SLAB, that addresses a means and a merits test. A child social worker or advocacy worker can assist the child with contacting a solicitor to make an application for ABWAR. Under our national scheme introduced in 2020, every child referred to a hearing already has a right to advocacy support. And in turn, those advocacy workers also have access to independent legal expertise when required. Pam Duncan Glancy. I, th I thank the Minister for taking the intervention, but on that point specifically, I think there is, is a difference, and I think mem members will understand that there is a difference um, between legal aid for a solicitor and advocacy, but also how would the Minister address the point in the briefing um, and information from Clan Child Law that said that, and, and I iterated this earlier, only 25 per cent of children who have been referred to a children's hearing on, ground, on offence grounds have a solicitor. The notification method currently used is not and cannot be improved to meet this duty. Minister. There is work ongoing in relation to that, and as I will get on to that in my notes um, if the member is happy with that. Children's hearings adopt a welfareist approach which aims to be non adversarial. While a children's hearing takes legally binding decisions, it is not an appropriate forum for detailed legal argument. A children's hearing should be a conversation, not a confrontation, and we should be mindful of the need to minimise the number of adult professionals in that system. A hearing's focus is to safeguard and promote the welfare of the child referred as the paramount consideration. And in most cases, it is not expected nor desirable that publicly funded legal representation be automatic. The availability of ABWAR for all children subject to proceedings, which ensures that relevant legal arguments can be put forward on their behalf, is considered to be appropriate. Now, I appreciate that Amendment 54 would add a more limited provision that this would only be in certain cases where the offence that the child has committed is one that a constable is required to jointly report to the principal reporter and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. This can be dealt with by way of regulations. This would allow the regulations to be drafted to be able to take into account any changes to the Lord Advocate's guidelines, the Disclosure Scotland Act 2020 and any other relevant issues. 
Once the structures of the new system are in place, the Scottish Government would be happy to give consideration to whether secondary legislation is necessary to ensure appropriate legal assistance is still available. And my preference would be to work with Ms Duncan Clancy on this issue in the months to come. Amendment 55, which would amend the Legal Aid Scotland Act 1986 to make children's legal aid available in all cases where a child is referred on the ground of having committed an offence, is therefore considered unnecessary. Finally, in relation to Amendment 56, which would require the Scottish Government to bring forward secondary legislation with the same effect as Amendment 55, for the same reasons that I have just described, I do not consider this to be necessary. Again, if, as the new system is implemented, there are reasons to doubt the assessment, that assessment, sorry, then Ministers have legislative options available under the section of the Legal Aid Scotland Act to amend the primary legislation. Ruth Maguire. I really appreciate the Minister giving way, and I, I totally understand the complexity of all this. I wonder if she could say a bit more about that specific problem that we identified in terms of children accepting offence grounds and then appearing on their, their record in later life, because I think that, that's the nub of it for many of us. Minister. So, as I said, that, uh, there is pending action in relation to the 2020 Disclosure Act and reconsidering the suitability of legal assistance available to children in the hearing system is already part of wider ongoing work. The Hearings for Children redesign report recommended further exploration of the mechanisms for children to access legal aid. I know that a concern that has been raised by other members. These issues will not only be subject to public consultation this summer, but non-legislative aspects will be overseen by the Children's Hearings Redesign Board in the course of 2024. It, it would seem odd to me to make this change now, only to revisit it again in the coming weeks as part of the hearings redesign process, only consulting upon it after its introduction here. Significant further work with social work, local authorities, SLAB and the wider legal professions representatives, including the Law Society of Scotland, is required. That work will allow us to keep under review our current assessment about the appropriateness of existing arrangements. I therefore urge the member not to press amendments 54, 55 and 56. And if they are pressed, I would urge the Chamber to reject them. Thank you. I call Pam Duncan Glancy to uh, wind up, Speaker, with, um, to press or withdraw Amendment uh, 54. I, I, I thank the Minister for, for those contributions. I, I'm struggling, if I'm honest, because we, when, during, between stage two and stage three, we had lengthy conversations about the sorts of regulation that could be put, taken forward in this regard. That's why this specific amendment is drafted the way it is. And it, I get the sense that the, the, the Minister is saying that it is now no longer necessary. On the point about um, offence grounds not being on a disclosure in future, and I take the point about what is happening um, at a date again in the future um, on what will appear, but as I raised with the Minister between Stage 2 and Stage 3, it's not, and I said on the record a moment ago, it is not just about what appears on disclosures, it is also about the cumulative thing that would appear on someone's police cheque. And I think if that comes up, then it could have a significant impact on children and young people's uh, lives as, as they grow into adulthood. I think it is important for members to remember that the, 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 the increase in age will, will come with it a difference in profile, and I think most members can accept that. For that reason, I think it is incredibly important that all of the children in the system, all of the people going through it, have access to legal aid, specifically um, on, the, on the basis of an automatic um, right and basis um, for, for legal aid, which is why I brought that amendment. Um, I, I also um, said that, that it would be important to do it on the face of the bill, and I am a bit, a bit disappointed that the, the Minister says that, we might, that there could be an opportunity for the Government to bring it in um, subordinate legislation. There is an opportunity now to do this on the bill in front of us, and if the Minister is concerned about other things that might happen or need to happen first, then I would suggest that the sequencing of this bill was something that the Committee highlighted and could have been addressed. Um, because we, a number of members and a number of witnesses indicated certain sequences would have to happen in order for this to be, to be done properly. I would suggest, um, and I would ask others to support these amendments on this basis, because this is one of the things that should be done before there are any changes to the system. Thank you. Pressing uh, amendment. Forgive me, President officer. Yes, I'm pressing the amendment. Thank you. question is that amendment uh, 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their votes now.
and the vote is now closed. Point of order, Tim Eagle. Sorry, presiding officer, I couldn't connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Eagle. I'll make sure that is recorded. And the result of the vote on Amendment 54 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes, 46, no, 64. There were no abstentions. Uh, the amendment is therefore not agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 55 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with Amendment 54. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is that uh, Amendment 55 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on amendment number 55 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes 47, no 65. There were no abstentions. Uh, the amendment is therefore not agreed. Call amendment 56 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy. Already debated with amendment 54. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that amendment 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment 56 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes, uh, 46, no, 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We turn now to Amendment 59 uh, in the name of Russell Finlay. Can I confirm, Mr Finlay, you do not wish to move this amendment? Correct. Thank you. And in relation to Amendment 60 in the name of uh, Russell Finlay, again, can I confirm you do not wish to move that amendment? Yes, confirm. And in relation to Amendment 61, Mr Finlay, can I confirm you do not intend to move that amendment? Thank you. And in relation to Amendment 62, can I confirm that you yes. do not wish to? Thank you very much indeed. Um, I now call uh, Amendment 26 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment um, 28. Minister, to formally move. Moved. Okay, the question is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 27 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment uh, 28. Uh, Minister, to formally move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 27 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. Call Amendment 63 in the name of Martin Whitfield, already debated with Amendment 40. Uh, Martin Whitfield, to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. Uh, I call Amendment uh, 64 in the name of Martin Whitfield, already debated with Amendment 40. Martin Whitfield, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment uh, 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division. Members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on amendment number 64 in the name of Martin Whitfield is yes, 47, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore uh, not agreed. Call amendment 65 in the name of Martin Whitfield. Uh, already debated with amendment 40. Martin Whitfield, to move or not move? Move. Question is that amendment 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division of members who cast their votes now. Delay and open the vote. Um, it should now be open. St still no signs? Good things come to those who wait. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on amendment number 65 in the name of Martin Whitfield is yes, 47, no, 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 66 in the name of Martin Whitfield. Already debated with amendment 40, Mr Whitfield, to move or not move. move. question is that amendment 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division and members should cast their votes now.
and the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment 66 in the name of Martin Whitfield is yes, 46, no, 65. There are no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 67 in the name of Martin Whitfield. Already debated with Amendment 40, Mr Whitfield, to move or not move? That is not moved. I call Amendment 68 in the name of Russell Finlay. Already debated with Amendment 58. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 69 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 41. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. Um, I call Amendment 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78 and 79, all in the name of Russell Finlay and all previously debated. Um, I would like to confirm whether or not Mr Finlay still intends not to move those amendments. Not moved. Um, does anybody have any objection to that? There is no objection. So I can confirm for the record that the following amendments in the name of Russell Finlay are not moved. 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78 and 79. That takes us on to Group 10, Reporting Requirements and Information Collection. I call Amendment 80 in the name of Martin Whitfield Group with Amendments 81, 85 and 86. Martin Whitfield to move Amendment 80 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Mr Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Residing Officer. We move to one of the sections that has been hinted at, pointed at and signposted at throughout this afternoon, which is regarding the information that should be collected that could be collected and that in a number of these amendments I suggest it is the Scottish Government's responsibility to ensure that it is collected so that we can make assessments as to how well the system is working, what the experience of children and young people travelling through the system irrespective of why their referral to the system is there so that we can with legislation that is forthcoming not least of all the redesign bill not least of all the promise bill which in all likelihood will come to us in the very near future, we can actually use objective evidence to see what the experience of people who interface with um, these systems are. In the first case, my amendment number 80 will require the government to carry out a review on the initiatives to support referral of children alleged to have committed offences through the restorative justice system and to report on this in a review. Amendment 81 will require the Government to report on the use of alternatives to detention for children convicted of an offence and, and on the support that those children received for the re rehabilitation and reintegration. Amendment 85 will require the Government to carry out a review of the information required to be collected to monitor the operation and impact of the Act and consider the outcome and characteristics of the children who have been referred to hearings and indeed convicted of offences. And the final one in this section, 80, Amendment 86, will require the Government to publish a report on the outcome of children referred to hearings of children convicted of an offence, including information on the characteristics, the provision of social work services to those children, the number reaffirmed on offence grounds and the number convicted of an offence that go on to reoffend the outcome for those on CSOs with MRCs and CSOs who are referred to a secure care. The reason for this is that the actual objective data um, that is in existence is incredibly challenging to bring together. It sits in a number of different areas at the moment and there is nobody with a responsibility to bring that together so that it can be available when we come to not only monitor how successful changes um, that are proposed within this bill uh, bring about, but also to provide us with the objective evidence that is genuinely needed in the design. We've already heard in a number of interventions and in previous um, amendments proposed that the lived experience of those who go through this system is incredibly, impo incredibly important. The human rights, the children's rights of this require, the welfare of our children require this to be the case. 
and if we are to positively look forward in the future to a redesigned system that reflects the needs of those who interface with it, along with the basic assumptions and strategies that we call for with regard to our young people and children growing up in Scotland, this data is crucial. And we can't be confronted with the challenge that has existed throughout the journey of this bill, that actually the figures are not known. The figures are unavailable. They sit somewhere else. And on a number of times that questions about data collection has been raised, the government have pointed to various bodies that are responsible for doing it. This is an opportunity for the Scottish Government to um, step up to its responsibility of understanding what the journey of our young people is like throughout their um, formative years, and particularly those, particularly those that come with certain characteristics, particularly those that have uh, return to the system to better understand why that's happening, how that's happening, and indeed how we can carry on to make Scotland the best place for young people and children to grow up, even those who interface with the children's hearing and the justice system. I'm grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call Rose McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I note the amendments within the grouping, and uh, we'll be supporting amendments of 81, 85 and 86. I have already mentioned it is important that we have a continual assessment on this process with continual review and reports brought to Parliament. This will ensure that the Government is able to appropriately respond to any gaps identified and issues surrounding victims' rights. We believe it is vital that victim experiences of the system are understood and responded to, and then any impact on the fulfilment of victims' rights is clearly identified. But unfortunately, we cannot support Amendment 80. Now, whilst I acknowledge the intent behind Martin Whitfield's amendment, I think there's questions on restorative justice and if it's appropriate in all instances, particularly for domestic abuse cases. And this is irrespective of age and the victim or the abuser. Domestic abuse, coercive control, intimate partner violence are not one-off events, but a course of conduct whose frequency and severity can escalate over time and reach across private and public spaces. Domestic abuse may continue overtly or covertly at different stages of a relationship and beyond, may be accompanied by stalking and harassment, including post-separation, irrespective of the party's engagement with the criminal justice system or the age of the offender or victim. So I'm concerned that Amendment 80, as drafted, is not domestic abuse trauma-informed, and for that reason we will not be supporting it, but are happy to support the other amendments in the group. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I understand the attention behind these amendments lodged by Mr Whitfield. Reviewing the processes and initiatives put in place to support children and understanding the outcomes of these on Scotland's children and young people is extremely important. However, Mr Whitfield brought forward similar amendments at stage two and I had the opportunity to share my concerns with him. I would not wish to create further reporting duties given much of this data is regularly reported on. On the reporting duty in Amendment 80, it is unclear what the added benefit of this would be. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that restorative justice services are available across Scotland and has been working in partnership with Community Justice Scotland and the Young People's Centre for Justice to deliver on this commitment. It is also committed to the recommendations in respect of the Hearings for Children report. Information about restorative justice services and the work being undertaken to achieve the commitment is already published on the Community Justice Scotland website, so an effective means of reporting on the provision of such services is currently available. We also support CYCJ to produce an annually updated practice guide on youth justice in which there is a restorative justice chapter. And the government will ensure this is covered in our new ju youth justice action plan when it is launched in June. Yeah, yes. Martin Whitfield. I'm very, I'm very grateful to the minister to take an intervention. Is she on behalf of the government confident that both objective and subjective evidence and data will be collected so that when the question comes for the, in particular, um, the redesign bill, that those tasked with looking at it will be able to find objective and subjective data of the experiences of young people travelling through the system so that we're not challenged with some of the things that's happened in relation to this bill with regard to data. Minister. I say that I am confident on that. 
Moving on to Amendment 81, the rehabilitation and reintegration of children who have committed an offence is a key tenet of the Scottish Government's whole system approach to preventing offending by children and young people. A package of support should be detailed in a child's plan to help them successfully integrate back into their community. And this is incorporated in the standards for those working with children in conflict with the law. Imposing a duty on the Scottish Ministers to report on something which is led by local authorities does not fit with the role of Scottish Ministers and would not work in practice. If the amendment is intended to be specific to an individual case, this would undermine the independence of the judiciary, and I am sure Mr Whitfield does not intend that. Moreover, data on the use of alternatives to detention for under-21s is set out in the annual statistical publication entitled Criminal Proceedings in Scotland, which is published on the Scottish Government's website. This amendment would seem unnecessary. Turning to Amendment 85, the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration already publishes a significant amount of information, both on its website as well as an, an annual statistical analysis, which covers much of the territory that the member identifies within Amendment 85. So to accept this amendment would lead to duplication in the system. The reporting duty in Amendment 86 also raises concerns because it singles out the publication of data in relation to a children referred to a children's hearing on offence grounds who go on to commit further offences. It is highly inappropriate and disproportionate to single out such referrals given the ethos of the children's hearing system. Even if data referred to in the amendments was to be published in an anonymised state, then it may be possible for those who have no need to know the information to piece together very sensitive and personally identifying information about a child, which would not be lawful under GDPR and would breach the children's rights to private life under Article 8 ECHR. Moreover, the reporting duty which the member aims to place on Scottish ministers lies more appropriately appropriately with other bodies with the specialist knowledge and expertise, for example, the provision of social services for secure care placements. I would also query whether the member has consulted with the Information Commissioner's Office on these amendments, given those serious data protection implications. Additionally, I am concerned by the loose definition of outcomes in Amendment 86. A positive outcome for one child may be significantly different to a positive outcome for another. I appreciate the intent of these amendments and the desire to understand how these complex mechanisms interact, but much of this data is already available, which would create undue duplication in the system. I would question the appropriateness of Amendment 81 as it would impact the independence of the judiciary. Additionally, Amendment 86 would be disproportionate and likely not lawful under GDPR and ECHR. I would therefore urge Mr Whitfield not to press Amendments 80, 81, 85 and 86, and if pressed, I would urge the Chamber to reject. Thank you. I call Martin Whitfield to wind up press a withdraw Amendment 80. Mr Whitfield. I am very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, and as I opened with my discussion about this group, this is about ensuring that data is available, that those who are tasked with the redesign, who are tasked with the Promise Bill, who are tasked with other legislation um, that we have uh, that we are now aware will have to be dealt with because of um, amendments that have already passed, that the Scottish Government has undertaken and is certain that this data will be available. That is not a level of confidence that existed at the beginning of the Bill, and under the circumstances, I would seek leave to withdraw 80 and not press the other matters. So the member is uh, seeking to withdraw Amendment 80. Does any other member object? No, Amendment 80 is therefore uh, withdrawn. So call Amendment 81 in the name of Martin Whitfield, already debated with Amendment 80. Martin Whitfield to move or not moved. Not moved. Um, we then move to Group 11, uh, Residential Accommodation for Children. I call Amendment 1 in the name of Sue Webber, grouped with Amendments 29 and 82. Sue Webber to move Amendment uh, 1 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Ms Webber. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. At the outset of uh, today's proceedings, Ruth Maguire stated that children can be victims and perpetrators of harmful behaviour. And there is always a fine balance with when we're managing the risk in that when two young people are involved in something that can be quite distressing. Uh, this bill brings forward changes 
that will end the placement of all under-18s in young offenders' institutions. And I'm clear that no child should be accommodated in the same secure accommodation facility as the child who has caused them harm. I recognise that all children in secure accommodation are vulnerable and that protections must be in place for their safety and that reassurance must be given that those protections are in place. Amendment 1, which I have brought forward today, would mean that before approving a secure accommodation service, the Scottish Ministers would need to satisfy that the service can ensure no child will be placed with another child in particular circumstances. Those are where it has been established that one child has offended against or in relation to another, or that they have acted or behaved in a way which has had or is likely to have had a serious adverse effect on the health, safety or development of the other child. I want to thank the Minister for productive discussions that we have had, following me bringing forward a quite simple amendment at stage two, which was uh, rejected. But what we have got here today is something we have both worked together with to make sure that this, these things go forward. And I am aware that there are processes in place for the appropriate placement of children in secure accommodation and that in practice no child who has committed an offence or harm against another child would be placed in the same facility as that child. However, it was really important that my amendment provides the reassurance on those processes as followed by the secure accommodation services and ensures that Scottish ministers are satisfied of that approach before approving such a service. I am Movement Amendment 1, my name, and I really encourage all members across the Chamber to support this amendment today. Thank you. Thank you. I call Rose McCall to speak to Amendment 29 and other amendments in the group. Ms McCall. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And yeah, I'm back on my feet trying again on this one because I keep getting uh, stories and I keep getting told of instances where uh, things that are happening on the ground are not necessarily what we have in here. And we're being told. I was speaking to a foster carer just last week who highlighted, amongst other things, his concern that due to lack of foster carers in his council area, children were being placed in residential facilities anywhere there was space for respite care. Now, this is not the first time I've been advised of this issue, and I know a few council areas have the same problem. And due to issues over a falling number of foster carers in Scotland, Children all over Scotland can be placed out with their council area and in residential accommodation where they would should normally be placed. They would normally be placed with a foster family locally in normal circumstances. Now, if we add that to reports that I'm getting from people I speak to, or care experience leavers, who tell us of six situations where they experience within residential settings, children placed in a safe environment away from home are then forced to live with other children that are banging on doors, threatening abuse or assault. The Care Experience community have been asking us to listen to them. Stop assuming that we know better and step up and protect them. And this amendment is an attempt to do that. It cannot be right that due to a lack of all-encompassing support at every level, young people have been moved from their homes in an attempt to keep them safe, only to be placed in an alternative living situation where they are unsafe. Now, I've heard the argument that this happens right now. I've heard the argument that it's in place. I've heard the argument that we have robust and secure processes. But care experienced people are asking us to look at this, to change it. And I'm asking members to listen and support them and this amendment. I'm also happy to support Amendment 1 in the name of Sue Webber. And I understand entirely where she's coming from. And I uh, appreciate the work that she's done with the government on that. And we're also supporting Amendment 83 in the name of Martin Whitfield. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Martin Whitfield to speak to uh, uh, Amendment 82 and other amendments in the group. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. With regard to Amendment 82, this reflects a reality that I think many people would already expect, that a young person who is in secure care is provided with the appropriate care, education and support, including advocacy support, which you've heard about in a number of other amendments, emotional and mental health support, health care, support to maintain family contact, which is recognised as incredibly important in the vast majority of cases, and indeed transition out of secure accommoda uh, accommodation and the aftercare support that's needed. By accepting this amendment onto the face of the bill, it will provide the protection that um, young people need, and more importantly, I think, will 
um, fulfil an expectation of something that already exists, but we know is not provided as successfully um, across the whole remit of the estate. Thank you. I now call Paul Keane. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I rise to make a, a brief contribution in, in reference to Amendment 29. And whilst I appreciate um, the contribution Ross McCall has made in terms of the concerns that have been raised to her by uh, the people that she mentioned in her contribution, I do want to put on record, I think, some of the evidence that has been produced by um, a, a number of organisations and indeed the social work profession in Scotland in terms of uh, the challenges with such an amendment that would seek to take a blanket approach to separating children within insecure care on the basis uh, of whether they had caused harm or had harm caused them, as I think we have heard across the course of the debate today. Um, indeed, um, I, I think what is clear uh, in speaking to members of the social work profession is that such an amendment that would take that blanket approach would actually fly in the face of the principles of Kilbrandon, which I think we have discussed a number of times within the process of this bill and indeed uh, in the course of the amendments here today. And I think it would in many ways significantly change the tone and the ethos of social work for children and young people uh, across Scotland. Uh, and I think the member has outlined concerns about resourcing in local authorities, and I think that is a very key concern, and I think it's a concern that has been repeated across the, the course of the debate today. But I do not believe that the blanket approach, as I have said, is the best way to deal with it. Indeed, I think that the, the um, amendment that has been brought forward by Sue Webber indeed, I think, deals with a, a particular issue and a particular challenge in ensuring that um, there is a, a safe provision and that that is considered prior to the approval of a secure setting. Uh, I, I wanted to highlight um, the letter that um, CYCGS um, wrote to a uh, committee in advance of stage two to point out um, that, that secure care since its inception has provided support, supervision and care to children who have both been harmed uh, and who have caused harm. And they go on to say that it is their opinion that any suggestion that secure care is not capable uh, of um, being able to um, support young people um, to share those spaces uh, is, is unfounded within um, their, their body of evidence. I, I would also like to just perhaps draw attention of the Chamber to um, evidence that has been provided uh, by the Department of Education in England in their 2021 report, Secure Children's Homes, that has looked at the placing of uh, welfare, children who are there on a welfare basis and children who are there on a justice basis uh, together in the same setting. And they found no evidence to support concerns that placing children from justice and welfare systems together in mixed settings uh, causes an increased risk of abuse. So notwithstanding, uh, I think what we've heard about resourcing and the concerns that have been raised, which I think are very important and the member is right to raise them, I do have a concern that such a blanket approach would not be appropriate and not in keeping with the Kilbrandon principles, which I think we all want to try and support in this bill. Yeah, I call Willie Rennie. Uh, first of all, apologies to Sue Webber for not being in at the start of her uh, contribution earlier. And I think Paul Kane, however, has actually summarised much of what I would like to say. He talked about tone and ethos and co-branding and the blanket approach. In effect, we need to have a risk-based approach, which is effectively what Sue Webber um, has adopted. We need to make sure that we trust the professionals who are working in the accommodation, uh, but demand high standards of them at the same time without being too prescriptive. And Sue Webber's amendment that sets out a reasonable condition that children should not be placed together where there has been an offence committed against them on, or where the child's conduct is likely to have a serious adverse effect on their health, their safety or their development of that child or another person. It puts health, safety, development and any offence at the heart of the operations and decisions. But I can't support Ros McCall's amendment, which separates children on offence grounds and others. It is unnecessary. It's an additional criteria that adopts a blanket approach. It would already be covered in many ways in important respects by Sue Webber's provisions. So I believe it isn't necessary and adds an unnecessary restriction. So, therefore, I will be supporting Sue Webber's amendment, but not Rose McCall's. Thank you, and I call the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. 
I would like to thank Ms Weber for bringing forward Amendment 1 and for her interest and considered engagement with the Government on this matter. As has been mentioned by Ms Weber, procedures are currently in place for the appropriate placement of children in secure accommodation. These manage the needs and risk profiles of each child entering secure accommodation through individualised risk assessments and plans. We can be confident in the existing experience and expertise of secure accommodation providers in carrying out the placement process alongside other professionals to ensure that the safety and protection of all children and staff are at the core. Robust placement processes already takes place in the current four secured accommodation services in Scotland, and we would expect that any new secured accommodation providers would follow this. Amendment 1 adds to the framework around these practices, and the Government supports it today. Turning to Amendment 29 from Ms McCall, I cannot support this. While also focused on those who have committed an offence, its aim is to separate all children who find themselves accommodated in a residential establishment because of having committed an offence from their peers. I am sorry to hear of the individual case that Ms McCall has raised, but I do not necessarily feel that this amendment would be the appropriate vehicle to, to help with that situation. As I mentioned during stage, stage 2 proceedings, the idea that greater risks are posed to children or staff within care services by those children who have committed an offence is simply not borne out of evidence, nor by insights of practitioners and managers. Not only is there no evidence to support the separation of children in the manner proposed by Ms McCall, this would be unworkable in practice, and Paul O'Kane raised some valuable concerns around this, which I will expand on. Whilst for a small number of placements, the reason for a child coming to be accommodated in a particular setting will be that they have committed an offence, things are not often as clear-cut as that. The reason for a placement will usually be wrapped up in a number of wider considerations and broader welfare issues. Many of the children who have committed an offence will be victims themselves, as outlined in research including from the Howard League for Penal Reform in 2016. Furthermore, Lord Kilbrandon's report in 1964 shifted our approach to addressing the needs of children as well as their behaviour. The care of children who have had adverse childhood experiences and complex trauma requires a sophisticated understanding and approach, and this is what has directed the care and the development of services across the sector, which we have seen over time. Separating children based on those who had a history of offending behaviour would go against an approach which the sector have been delivering for years and runs counter to the aspirations of the promise. Rather than a blanket separation of children, an individualised response is needed to the placement of children in care, which allows the professionals involved the ability to consider the needs and the well-being of a child alongside that of others. As I have mentioned, a rigorous placement process is already carried out for each child requiring a placement, and this is the case in all residential care home settings. Turning to Amendment 82, the definition of secure accommodation service already includes much of what is listed in this amendment as part of the service's core purpose. All children's health, education and other needs are individual and therefore cannot be prescribed in legislation. Although secure accommodation providers must ensure the welfare of all children is safeguarded and promoted, in practice this will be done in collaboration with other relevant authorities and in accordance with contractual arrangements. Whilst I appreciate it is well intentioned, this amendment could cause confusion as to where responsibilities lie and compel secure accommodation services to ensure that support is provided even when a child is no longer accommodated by them. For example, local authorities already have aftercare duties towards looked after children under the Children's Scotland Act 1995. And it is not clear what a secure accommodation service could add to that, particularly as it will not maintain a relationship with the child once they leave the service. So, in summary, I would urge members to support Amendment 1 and reject Amendments 29 and 82. Thank you. And I call Sue Webber to wind up press a withdrawal Amendment 1. Ms Webber. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Yes, foster care is, of course, a preferred option in many of the cases that uh, Ros McCall has uh, discussed this, morning, this afternoon. This evening, rather, uh, and I'm so. I suppose I'm satisfied that the amendment that I've tabled today will provide the assurance that the very best option will be provided, and the young people that are needed to go into care will be in the best place for them. 
Um, Martin Whitfield's amendment does speak about the extensive range of services that should be available directly at, in secure care settings. But the, when we have carried out some of the visits that we took as part of the committee evidence, we saw that many of these services are there or provided by uh, partner, in partnership with our providers, whether it be the NHS, the local authority or indeed third sector. So I think I'm echoing what the member said there. So with that, uh, presiding officer, I'm delighted that it seems my amendment one might pass and I will uh, sit down and press my amendment. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. We move to Group 12, Minor and Technical. I call Amendment 28 in the name of the Minister. Uh, group with Amendments 30, 31, 32 and 37. Minister to move Amendment 28 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Amendments 28, 30, 31 and 32 are technical amendments which alter sections 23 and 24 of the Bill with regards to the definition of a cross-border placement and residential establishment. Amendments 30 and 31 ensure that the definition of cross-border placement in section 24.5b of the Bill aligns with the definition in section 25.a.2, which was updated at stage 2. The effect of this will be that the definition will be the same for the purposes of new section 33A of the Children's Scotland Act 1995 and part 5 of the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010. Amendment 32 inserts a definition of residential establishment into the relevant interpre interpretation provision in the 2010 Act in consequence of the new cross-border placement definition. Amendment 28 simply cross-refers to that to avoid replicating the definition elsewhere in the 2010 Act. Amendment 37 is also technical. It brings the definition of child in the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Act 2019 into line with the changes being made by the Bill to the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011 and the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 95. I move amendments 28, 30, 31, 32 and 37. Thank you. And I call Rose McCall. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. I just wanted to respond. And as most of the amendments in the group are minor and technical in nature, we will be supporting amendments 28, 30, 31 and 37. And in relation to 32, I wasn't quite sure what residential establishment was, but I appreciate what the Minister has just informed and the reasons behind it. So listen carefully to that and be content to support that on that basis. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Minister to wind up. Nothing to add. Formally okay. <laughs> the question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, we are agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 29 in the name of Ros McCall, already debated with Amendment 1. Ros McCall to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 82 in the name of Martin Whitfield, already debated with Amendment uh, 1. Martin Whitfield to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Okay, the result of the vote on Amendment uh, 82 in the name of Martin Whitfield is yes 46, uh, no 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendments 30, 31 and 32, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments 30 to 32 on block. Minister. Moved. 
Thank you. Does any uh, member uh, object to a single question being put on amendments 30 to 32? No member objects. Therefore, the question is that amendments 30 to 32 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. It takes us to Group 13, cross-border placements. Call Amendment 33 in the name of Michael Mara in a group on its own. Michael Mara to move and speak to Amendment 33. Thank you, President Officer. The single amendment in this group relates to the issue of cross-border placements when a child resident in England, Wales or Northern Ireland is placed in secure care in Scotland. Uh, and the primary reason why cross-border placements are needed is the shortage of secure care in England. At present, there are only 13 operational secure care centres in England, and Ofsted have reported in 2022 that on any given day, 50 children are waiting for a place. In May 2023, The Guardian reported that a 12-year-old child in England had been transferred to an emergency placement in a travel lodge with police in attendance. That should give us some idea of the dire state of the secure care sector in England. Mr Mara, if I could ask you, there is too much background now and too many conversations taking place around the chamber. Could we have the give the respect to the member who is on his feet. Mr Maram, please continue. Thanks, President Officer. Children requiring secure care have very often been exposed to violence, abuse, trauma and are at risk of significant further harm to themselves and to others. And these are some of the most vulnerable children in our country. And at the heart of cross-border placements, there is, I believe, a principle of giving refuge to those who require it. But there are also practical reasons why cross-border placements must continue. It may be the case that a child in the north of England is living closer to a secure care centre in Scotland than one in the south of England. In such cases, we should not allow the jurisdictional border to dictate where they go, when a cross-border placement means they retain proximity to their home. On the 29th of March 2023, the Education, Children and Young People Committee heard evidence from colleagues in the secure care centre in uh, sector in Scotland that there are cases where it is appropriate for a child to have a secure care placement far removed from their home. This is particularly relevant in cases of child criminal exploitation, as it allows the child, crucially, to break ties with criminal networks in their home community. Yet the prevailing policy discourse uh, dictates a preference for keeping children close to home. Appearing at the Education Committee on 3rd of May 2023, the Minister stated, and I quote, we have been clear that the number of cross-border placements needs to be reduced. In a subsequent appearance on 7th of February 2024, the Minister referenced the promise, which is a Scottish Government policy, saying in the promise there was a move towards fewer children moving out with their local authority. The Government must recognise that a blanket policy of reducing the number of cross-border placements, or indeed eliminating them, is simplistic and fails to account for the circumstances that I have outlined so far. There is also a more immediate reason for the secure care sector in Scotland to continue accepting cross-border placements. The Education Committee was told by colleagues working in the sector that as many as 50 per cent of young people in their care are coming from cross-border pl pl placements. The rate paid for a child on a cross-border placement is higher than the Scottish Excel framework rate, meaning the sector in Scotland is to a large extent reliant on cross-border placements to keep the lights on. These are the words of one secure care sector professional. Without that income subsidy, no service for Scottish children would exist. If it is the Scottish Government's policy to reduce cross-border placements, they will have to give consideration to how that could be achieved without exposing the sector in Scotland to very significant financial risk. Worryingly, in that prevailing discourse on cross-border placements, there appears to be a quite incredible theory that if we close our doors to children from England, that will somehow force the Tory government to change its behaviour. Frankly, I find that to be risible. In evidence to the Education Committee on 22nd of March 2023, the Children and Young People's Commissioner's Office stated, and I quote, by making it harder for local authorities to place children in Scotland, our hope would be that that would somewhat force the issue of providing more appropriate places in England. The Tories privatised the system in England and have driven it to the point of collapse. The idea that they will see the error of their ways now is ludicrous. A callous disregard for the lives of the most vulnerable children in England does not give us licence here to turn a blind eye to these children and hope the problem will go away. 
Closing our doors to these young people will only put them at greater risk in a dysfunctional English system. These are young people, presiding officer, in need of safe refuge, and it matters not whether they came, across the boat, uh, came on a boat across the Channel or on a plane out of a war zone or in a secure van across the border. Our common humanity and basic decency should tell us that we owe them refuge if we can possibly provide it. And yet I'm still unclear as to what the Scottish Government's policy on cross-border placements actually is. I raised this issue in my time on the Education Committee, then a Finance Committee with the Minister on 9 May 2023. I brought amendments at Stage 2 and questioned the Minister again at Education Committee on 7 February of this year. The Minister kindly met with me last month. I have written to her and I have her response here. Unfortunately, despite all of that, the Scottish Government's policy is at best confused. In a letter to me, the Minister states that, and I quote, the Scottish Government's intention is therefore not intended to arbitrarily reduce numbers of cross-border placements. But later in the letter, addressing the issue of financial sustainability, she speaks of changes required to facilitate significant reduction in cross-border placements. So I am seeking clarity on the record here today. Which is it? Eliminate, reduce, stay the same. What level of reduction does significant reduction actually mean? And by what policy measure will that end be achieved? And summing up in this area, President Officer, I would ask the Minister to give a cast iron assurance in the clearest possible language of the Scottish Government's position on cross border placements. The amendment itself, I believe, is consensual and reasonable, and it seeks to provide assurance on the operation of that cross-border system. It requires the Scottish Government to review and publish a report on cross-border placements one year after royal assent, and in particular that review will look at the number of cross-border placements, as well as the services and support provided to children subject to those placements. I believe the amendment constitutes a very reasonable safeguard to monitor the trend of cross-border placements, should the Government be pursuing the policy on which I am seeking to obtain clarity today. I move the amendment. Thank you. I now call Willie Rennie. Um, I think Michael Marr is right in many respects. Um, whilst it should always be an option that the capacity in Scotland can be used by children and uh, administrations across the United Kingdom, we should be concerned about the extent of cross-border placement from English local authorities. Children, I think, in the main, should be placed as close to home as is possible, as was set out in the promise. But this hasn't been possible because of the, the chaos that exists within uh, the English system and the limited capacity that comes from that. But that has a direct impact now for a Scottish child and an English child in the same facility have different rights. And that can't possibly be sustainable in the long term. We need to have an equivalence. We need to have enhanced rights where we possibly can. So that brings into sharp focus the problem that we do have. But this is a symptom of a problem from elsewhere, and it's not our responsibility just the same, it's not our responsibility directly to solve the problem in England, and there, but we should not therefore just deal with the symptoms. We need to try and help solve the main problem. Yes. Michael Mara. I appreciate Mr Rennie giving way. Does it recognise that within I agree that there's a conflict in terms of the legal system, in terms of rights that are provided to children coming from these different ju jurisdictions. But at the core of this is that it, is it not a worse offence against that child's rights if they are put at risk by not being able to access secure care in Scotland? Willie Rennie. Uh, yes, I, I, I do agree with that, and that's why we can't have a hard and fast rule on this. We need to make our facilities open, but it's clearly a symptom of a problem elsewhere in the United Kingdom that does need to be resolved. Um, but there are some parts of the UK that are actually getting this right. My I have to say, Liberal Democrat colleagues in Somerset Council uh, joined forces with the Shaw Trust and the local NHS to deliver Homes for Horizon project. It delivered 10 family-sized homes, 20 specialist foster carers and a brand new therapeutic education service on two sites. So it shows that it's possible. They won awards for that work. But it shows that it's possible and there is change within England and we should be encouraging that change for where it's appropriate for children to remain closer to home. Yes. John Swinney. I'm very grateful to Mr Rennie for giving way. And the example that he cites from Somerset, I think, is a very good example of the willingness of public authorities 
to contemplate the fact that their existing provision and their existing approach is just not good enough, which is, of course, the thinking that underpins the promise. But I think the challenge with which we all wrestle, and I know ministers wrestled with this just now, is that that thinking and that willingness to confront that unacceptability of current provision is not always prevalent in public authorities. And perhaps this bill and the comments that he's put on the record will help that process. Willie Rennie. It was my, my, my colleagues in, in Somerset recognised that their young people were spread right across England and further beyond, and they regarded that as unacceptable. And they wanted them to be brought back home, closer to their families and their connections. And that's something that I hope, as best practice, can be spread to other authorities in England. And that's why they won the award. And that's why I'm promoting it today, because it's important that we do spread that best practice. But we've got a role as well, which is why I will support Michael Mara's amendment, because I think by introducing the provision that he's uh, put in his amendment for a review of cross-border placements no later than a year after Royal Assent, I think that will give an extra focus on the symptoms that we are seeing in homes here in Scotland. So that's why I think we should support this. But he's also right to raise a key point that if English councils do introduce reforms on the lines that Somerset have introduced, there will be an issue for the homes here in Scotland because their financial models are based on significant numbers of young people coming from other parts of the United Kingdom. And if that goes, and it goes quickly, that will cause significant problems, particularly where we are relying on that capacity ourselves to house our own here Scottish children in Scottish homes. So that's why the Minister does need to have a more comprehensive understanding of how this is changing and what the financial impact will be if it changes very suddenly. And there may need to be some interventions and support to make sure that the capacity that we rely on is maintained. So we will support Michael Mara's Amendment 33, probably for slightly different reasons, um, but I think it's important that we do have a proper understanding of what's happening with cross-border placements. We encourage English councils to follow the route of Somerset, and we make sure that young people's rights are enhanced here in Scotland. Thank you. And I call the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful to Mr Mara for our discussion in advance of Stage 3, and I do appreciate his interest in cross-border placements and ensuring children and young people have access to services that they need. Now, during that discussion, I did think that I had alleviated some of Mr Mara's concerns, so I'd like to emphasise again. I do not see this as political. This is not about forcing anyone to act. What should be forcing people to act is the priority to ensure that what is happening is in the best interests of the child. Of course, there will always be exceptional circumstances where children are required to be placed in Scotland, but that is what they should be. Exceptional circumstances based on that case-by-case -case basis for the child, not a as a result of a lack of accommodation in England. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to put numbers on how many cross-border placements I would like to see or not see, because, again, I just want to reiterate, I wouldn't expect numbers to ever be on this, because it will be on a case-by-case -case basis. So, as I say, we need to focus on what is best for the child and stop thinking about numbers or targets. Now, as I made clear to Mr Mara when we met, my intention is to ensure that statutory care planning duties in other jurisdictions have been demonstrably met prior to any child being placed in Scotland. We are continuing to work with our counterparts in other administrations to achieve this, and we are clear that in cases such as deprivation of liberty order placements, where a child placement in Scotland is only intended to be temporary, that the placing authority should maintain its relationship with the child and retain responsibility for ensuring they have access to appropriate services and support. Mr Mara's proposed duty on ministers would require reporting on services provided to children on cross-border placements, but it is not clear exactly what services are being referred to and how it is proposed that ministers would obtain information on these from the wide range of people and organisations who would provide them. I am also not clear what the purpose of collating this information would be and what value it would add to the extensive work that the Scottish Government is already undertaking on cross-border placements, as I have previously discussed with Mr Mara. 
But I can assure Mr Mara that we want to ensure that all children who are placed in Scotland have access to the right services, to ensure their rights are respected and that their needs are met. And this will be a key consideration in the development of future regulations enabled by the Bill, if passed by this Parliament. The Scottish Government does currently have mechanisms in place to review and understand issues arising in Scotland as a, as a result of cross-border placements to inform the approach to future regulations. So, for example, the Care Inspectorate will soon provide us with further intelligence from its thematic review of cross-border placements. And this will include assessment of the practical realities of such placements into Scottish children's residential care homes from a variety of perspectives. It will be informed by feedback from ch children and young people who have been placed in Scotland, placing authorities, Scottish receiving local authorities, service providers, as well as the police, health boards and education providers in Scotland. That, alongside the wide range of additional evidence my officials have been compiling, enables us to pinpoint the key challenges at play. The Care Inspector also continues to monitor the number of placements made into Scotland, given it is notified of placements of children and young people into and out of Scotland. Our absolute priority is ensuring that any risks for a child are mitigated as early on in the cross-border placement process as is possible. And that's why if the bill passes with the bolstered powers we need to do so, we'll prioritise the development of regulations on cross-border placements. A key consideration for those regulations, as I discussed with Mr Mara, will be to ensure that further processes are enacted to safeguard children with clear lines of accountability and escalation where there is risk or concern in relation to how that child is being supported. In my view, development of the regulations is where we need to focus our resources and attention post-commencement of the Bill, rather than putting time and energy into a one-off retrospective review and report. Those regulations will be subject to the affirmative procedure, so the Parliament will get the chance to fully scrutinise and debate them. Moreover, the factual circumstances and evidence supporting the regulations will be set out and published in the policy memorandum and impact assessments which accompany them. Of course, we would intend to assess the effectiveness of any new regulations after they have come into force, and again, we believe this would be a more fruitful exercise than reviewing where things stand in the year following Royal Assent. Of course, I am also happy to continue discussions with Mr Mara in this light. On that basis, I cannot support Amendment 33. I would urge Mr Mara not to press it, and if it is pressed, I would ask members to reject. Thank you. I call Michael Mara to wind up press withdrawal amendment 33. Mr Mara. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I, I thank um, for Willie Rennie for his contribution to the debate, indeed to the Minister uh, for her own. I, I think Willie Rennie is absolutely right to highlight the, uh, the, the, work, the good work of uh, colleagues uh, in Somerset in terms of the kind of change that is possible. I know it is a, a process that many local authorities in Scotland are going through and trying to bring younger people closer home to their own communities, and that is a positive thing. It's, uh, it, it, that we should support that kind of good practice where it arises from, and uh, John Swinney does is right in highlighting some of that uh, process um, as well. And I do think it is married to that core challenge of uh, financial fragility. Um, I, I hope, frankly, that we're in the situation where the cross-border placement numbers do reduce as a result of a successful reform and change in the English system, and that we have to deal with some of these challenges as a result of better outcomes for young people in England. But frankly, at the moment, I'm deeply sceptical that that is going to take place. Um, and I would say, say to the Minister that she, um, she said we are not forcing anyone to act. And, and I hear her words in that regard, but it does stand in contrast to the evidence from the Children's Commissioner officer who said that they want to see that a change of behaviour in England forced by a reduction in those numbers um, in Scotland. And she talks about the exceptional circumstances as being uh, the, the, the case in which young people should be uh, removed from their communities and put on cross-border placements to Scotland. And I would absolutely agree it should be exceptional circumstances, but at the moment that is not the case. And that is, that is clearly as a result of the lack of accommodation in England. And we have to deal with that as the reality of what we find. We can't hope that the situation is different. We have to cope with it as it is and try and do our best 
to reform it on that basis. Um, I, I would say that to the Minister that she's saying, uh, on one hand, that she, it's not clear on how we will obtain the information. Uh, I would suggest that she ask for the information, because it seemed in the rest of her uh, response that much of it was readily available. I think it's appropriate for Parliament to have a considered look at that uh, situation a year on from the publication um, of this, um, of this uh, the, sorry, the um, royal assent of this bill should it pass. Um, so we, uh, it's, I would say, I would, I'm glad in closing, when she talks about uh, looking to uh, uh, consider the impact of the arrangements and prioritising some of these arrangements, um, I would particularly highlight to the issue of a return to local authorities' arrangements on cross-border placements, uh, which can often be chaotic uh, for, for young people and uh, rearranged at the very uh, last moment. I would say I do not believe this uh, amendment to be onerous. I believe it to be a reasonable uh, request in order to give some form of further oversight for, for Parliament and some uh, insight into the issue. And on that basis, I will be pressing the amendment. Thank you. The question is that Amendment uh, 33 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. The members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Alec Rowley for a point of order. Saying officer, I've devoted yes. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. I'll make sure that is recorded. Point of order, Foisal Chowdhury. My app didn't work either. I would have voted yes. I'll make sure that is recorded, Mr Chowdhury. The result of the vote on Amendment 33 in the name of Michael Mara is yes 21, no 89. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 83 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 40, 41. Russell Finlay to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. It takes us to Group 14, Decisions to Prosecute Children, UNCRC Compatibility Issues. I call Amendment 34 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments uh, 36 and 39. Cabinet Secretary to move uh, Amendment 34 and speak to other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Amendments 34, 36 and 39 seek to protect the rights of victims as a result of the effect in criminal proceedings of the UNCRC and Corporation Scotland Act 2024. In considering detailed implementation for UNCRC and Corporation Act, a particular issue has been identified in relation to an adverse impact on criminal proceedings, which the Scottish Government wishes to rectify. This impact relates to Section 8 of the 2024 Act. This section deals with judicial remedies that a court or tribunal can grant on finding that a public authority has acted or was proposing to act incompatibly with the UNCRC recommendations. A court or tribunal can be a criminal court where an inca incompatibility uh, issue arises in criminal proceedings. 
Section 8 provides that a criminal court in those circumstances may grant such relief or remedy or make such order within its powers as it considers effective, just and appropriate. This would include the power to desert criminal proceedings. Presiding officer, the UNCRC requirements are far-reaching and will provide new grounds of challenge to prosecutorial decision-making that do not exist at the moment, including in relation to ECHR. Those new grounds of challenges have the potential to lead to outcomes in criminal cases which could have a negative impact on the rights of victims who may themselves be children. For example, it may lead to a prosecution failing in re respect of a child who is alleged to have committed an extremely serious offence, potentially against another child who is the victim. If that were to happen, the resulting impact on the victim could be severe and potentially place the wider public at risk of harm through further offending. Amendment 34, which is the main amendment in this group, seeks to mitigate against us. It will adjust the application of Section 8 of the 2024 Act in cases where a criminal court has determined that the decision to prosecute a child was incompatible with the UNCRC requirements and is contemplating deserting the case. The priority is to make sure that cases are not deserted in circumstances where the prosecution decision can be retaken in a way that is compatible with the UNCRC requirements and there is no other reason why desertion would be appropriate. I will, I will Mr Whitfield. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary to take an intervention on, that, on, on this very point. But this is one of the results of human rights, and it becomes a balance between two, often between two individuals' human, human rights as to which, is, which should take prevalence. And we have a well-established process on how we decide this. Why do we need to abandon the UNCRC even before, or an element of the UNCRC, even before it actually comes into force without relying on the pre-existing way of that decision being made. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President, I very much appreciate Mr Whitfield's point. Um, it gives me the, the opportunity to stress that it is not a case uh, of us abandoning UNCRC, uh, far from it, but it is a recognition as a result of the in-depth implementation work uh, that has been pursued across government that UNCRC requirements are far more far-reaching because they extend beyond the fear of criminal proceedings themselves and into prosecutorial decision making. This is a new ground of challenge uh, that does not exist at the moment and the risk is amplified. And I think the next point will directly address uh, Mr Whitfield's point that the lack of authoritative interpretations of UNCRC uh, uh, add uh, to the risk if, when by comparison, unlike when ECHR uh, were incorporated into domestic law uh, via the Human Rights Act in 1998, uh, there is no existing body of case law in relation to the interpretation of UNCRC. And this is an issue uh, that we need to address. Uh, but as I proceed, Mr Whitfield, I hope you will see that we're doing it in a balanced and proportionate way. It is not um, in, in the issue that we seek to mitigate. Uh, we are not doing so uh, in an unfettered way that doesn't have um, boundaries, if you will uh, bear, bear with me. Poseidon officer, we, we do consider that this is important to address, to uphold the interests of all involved in a case, including child victims, who may be denied justice if a case is deserted and not able to be progressed through new criminal proceedings due to expiry of relevant uh, criminal proceeding time limits or because the court has ruled that it cannot be re-raised. The effect of Amendment 34 will be to require the court to adjourn the case to allow the prosecutor 
to reconsider the decision to prosecute in a way which is compatible with the UNCRC requirements. However, this requirement applies in limited circumstances. For instance, the requirement will not apply if the court is contemplating deserting proceedings because of another UNCRC compatibility issue arising in the case which is unconnected to the decision to prosecute. It will also not affect the court's power to desert proceedings in response to matters which are currently unlawful and where that remedy is available to the court, for example, in respect of an action which is compatible with ECHR rights. Moreover, the requirement will not apply if any one of the three exceptions applies. The first is where there is no reasonable prospect of the decision to prosecute being reconsidered in a UNCRC compatible way. The second is where there are exceptional circumstances which justify the court denying a reconsideration. And the third is where the prosecutor has already had the opportunity to reconsider the decision to prosecute and the court considers it remains incompatible with the UNCRC requirements. Presiding officer, the amendments recognise the uncertain and far-reaching impact of the UNCRC requirements on decisions to prosecute. They strike a fair and proportionate balance between protecting victims and serving justice in the public interest and upholding the rights of children involved in criminal proceedings. In doing so, they afford the prosecutor an opportunity to remedy a breach of the UNCRC requirements in a clear, certain and transparent way while retaining the court's ultimate judicial discretion in granting an effective, just and appropriate remedy for any UNCRC breach. Presiding officer, Amendment 36 would bring the provisions in Amendment 34 into force on the day after Royal Assent or the 16th of July 2024, whichever is later. This approach ensures as many as possible, as much as possible, that the protection for victims' rights are in force for the 16th of July this year, which is when general commencement of the 2024 Act is scheduled to take place. Amendment 39 is a minor consequential change to the long title of the bill, and I move Amendment 34. Thank you. And I call Rose McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And it's to 34 that I would like to um, focus my remarks. Victim Support Scotland were quite correct in their briefing ahead of the Stage 3 uh, debate, where they said, we're concerned by the Government's amendment relating to UNCRC compatibility issues in relation to decisions to prosecute a child. This amendment could have potentially significant consequences for a victim. It provides the courts and the COPFS the power to acquit the defendant or adjourn cases for an indefinite period of time if it is believed that the prosecution of this case is not compatible with UNCRC legislation. We believe this amendment contradicts assurances victim support organisations have been given regarding the Lord Advocate's guidelines and the retention of the power to dispose cases to the criminal justice system. We do not believe this is in line with trauma-informed practices and we're deeply concerned that an amendment with such potential significant impact has been brought forward at this stage without adequate time to scrutinise it and we will not be supporting Amendment 34 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you. Thank you. I call Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, there are two elements that I would like to deal with this. The first in relation to all of the amendments and when they've been lodged, because there has been um, very obviously insufficient time to look into the depth um, of the effect of these. And I refer back into the opening Group 1, where concern was expressed by the Scottish Government where proper consultation hadn't taken place, then we shouldn't entertain these. I also raise um, a matter that is, is on the record from the 27th of March 2024 when I asked the First Minister the position with regard to substantial changes coming at Stage 3, and I quote, I would say, said the First Minister, that Stage 3 certainly allows for debate, for frank and free exchange of views on any amendment. However, I do not disagree with you. It is better for everybody involved if amendments certainly substantial amendments that would have a significant impact on legislation can be lodged at stage two. 
It would appear from the Cabinet Secretary's um, submissions today that this arose as a result of the Scottish Government's cross-government work on the effect of the UNCRC. When we raised the question of the UNCRC with regard to the bill that we're very talking about, we were told it was too late. The bill was in existence and it would be looked at later on. We were also told by the Scottish Government that the cross-government work would be to identify where the UNCRC could be used to support young people. And here it would appear that the very first issue that has come to light is that there is a challenge under the UNCRC with regard to prosecuting decisions. <clears throat> and we have a situation that has now arisen where there is a potential conflict where presumably on a, an individual identifying that they're being prosecuted, they also identif identify a potential challenge under their human rights. And thus the conflict that the Cabinet Secretary has articulated may occur in our courts. More than happy to give away. Professor Finlay. To, to help me better understand what is being said here, there's a whole raft of important stage three amendments being brought forward by the government. Has this been done because they've hit some kind of mad panic and they've realised this needs to be in the legislation? Is it incompetence or is there some other agenda that isn't obvious? Martin Whitfield. I'm, gra I'm grateful for the intervention. I think we have seen in the past ironically with the UNCRC itself, where amendments are made at stage three, um, I would say unforeseen, but certainly the Scottish Government's unforeseen consequences of those amendments have caused significant problems, not just to the procedural aspects within this Parliament, but indeed to people across Scotland. So I am extremely concerned that a number of incredibly complex amendments which lack explanation other than in a prosecution decision where it is likely to take effect, um, have been brought at stage three. And indeed, it's interesting that in um, part response to my intervention, the Cabinet Secretary has talked about the challenge that there is a lack of case law to identify the extent of the UNCRC. Um, I think it is, is somewhat unfair to say that in the previous time um, there was substantial case law that was, that was based on it, the system that we already use under the ECHR, because actually when it was brought in people were unclear as to the extent of it, and that has developed over time. It is also, I think, notwithstanding the validity otherwise of this amendment, incredibly unfortunate that possibly one of the most important pieces of legislation ever to come before the Scottish Parliament, and in this its 25th year, and at this before an Act actually even takes effect, we are seeking to amend it. I am disappointed, and I phrase it that way, I am disappointed that these challenges were not identified by the Scottish Government in the substantial period they have had to look at the, UC, uh, the, the UNCRC and to have come to us with that. When I come to the specific amendments, they dilute the Act. I think that has to be agreed. And at the end of the day, the appropriate decision maker, where we have a conflict of human rights, with the greatest of respect, should be courts. It should be the court that makes that decision, not the state. The position at the moment, on my understanding, is the presumption should be given to the prosecutor an opportunity to reconsider the bringing of criminal proceedings against a person which is compatible with the UNCRC. My understanding is that that can't simply be a rephrasing of it because it would still fall foul of the UNCRC. So is it the position of the government that prosecutors are going to be asked to go away and reconsider in its entirety where any potential criminal liability would lie, because simply rephrasing the charge sheet, I'm not sure, would satisfy existing case law where it's breached it. I am also incredibly concerned that, you know, even if this presumption is accepted, the exceptional circumstances criteria for a court to rebut this is perhaps at the highest possible level it can be. The appropriate solution with respect to rights, as I've already said, is that the court should continue the case if it considers it's necessary in the interest of, dis of justice. The decision would be informed by submissions from all parties 
on the relevant human rights issue, that must have been investigated for it to be raised at, at, at some stage with the prosecutor. And of course, the procurator fiscal can contribute to that decision. And then if the case is not continued, there is an appeal to the Crown. This is how the challenges work at the moment, and they've worked very effectively for the past 20 years. To revert, consultations on this amendment with the greatest respect, seem incredibly thin on the ground. A number of um, people outside and uh, groups outside of this place have said they just can't even get their heads around what this is about and therefore can't contribute. Those that have, have absolutely expressed concern at the lateness this has come to us, the complexity it's come to us, the fact that there are not worked examples that could be looked at. And frankly, to go against the UNCRC at the first opportunity presented to the Scottish Government, I have to say, is not a good look. And so I would, in, in, to replicate something that I have heard a lot, stage three is not the place for this. There are avenues that it could be looked at and bills that are already at stage one, and we cannot support that today. I'm grateful. Thank you. I call Willie Rennie. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has done something quite remarkable. She's managed to unite a whole range of stakeholders. Scottish Women's Aid, who described these amendments as impenetrable. Children's First said it was not clear, and Victim Support said they were deeply concerned. Now, we've had an explanation from the Cabinet Secretary uh, today. To be honest, I would prefer to have been able to put those points to experts and stakeholders and advisers long before today. We didn't have any explanation in advance of stage three. We had to seek through SPICE some kind of explanation as to what these amendments actually meant. Now, I have no reason to distrust the Cabinet Secretary, but I would have preferred to have been some degree of consultation and debate outside of this chamber before um, we were able to, or forced effectively, to consider and vote on these uh, amendments. So we've been put in an impossible position um, this, or this evening. And I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary herself knows that this is an unsatisfactory way to proceed. It's an opaque way, and it's not how stage three, I think, should uh, be done. Um, so we have yet um, to consider. I'm grateful for uh, Martin Whitfield's forensic um, questions um, to the Cabinet Secretary. I hope she'll be able to answer some of them. But if she's not able to, we won't be voting for these amendments. Thank you. I call the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And I do, of course, uh, appreciate the uh, comments of all members who have participated uh, in Section 14. Um, I would, of course, um, hope that people uh, will appreciate that um, action you know, has to be taken. And I would have hoped there would have been at least you know, some reassurance to Parliament uh, that we certainly have our um, eye on the detail. And given the the forthcoming um, implementation of the UNCRC legislation, uh, I certainly felt, uh, bearing in mind the representation I've had uh, from prosecutors about a potential um, gap or issue or risk uh, where very serious cases could be deserted to take the first opportunity uh, to bring it to this Parliament and indeed uh, to Parliament uh, as a whole. It is uh, the position of the government that uh, we consider these amendments are justified to protect the rights of victims, um, including uh, the rights of child victims, because I'm sure um, no one uh, would want to see uh, cases where uh, courts were deserting cases because of an incompatibility uh, with UNCRC, for example, maybe you know, Article 12, where the, the views of the child uh, hadn't been taken um, into consideration, that we would all um, expect that it be in the interest of justice to have some sort of remedy uh, to that situation. Can I just uh, again put on the record that uh, UNCRC requirements are far more uh, far-reaching um, than uh, ECHR, uh, and that for the first time uh, they do uh, take us in to uh, decisions uh, made by prosecutors. Uh, and I, would, I won't reiterate the entire statement, but there are some very clear limits uh, on both the uh, limitations for courts uh, and indeed 
um, the uh, uh, prosecutors and the circumstances in which decisions can be uh, revisited uh, or indeed um, overturned. Um, I have already uh, said, uh, President Officer, that uh, some of the issue here is that there is a lack of authoritative interpretations uh, on the UNCRC requirements, unlike uh, the body of case law that exists around ECHR. And if I can also just once again refute that this is not the case, uh, that UNCRC is lesser than ECHR rights. Uh, they are just um, different and in this instance require different provision. If I can also say that... Um, um, if, please, please, yeah. Martin Whitfield. Why is the Scottish Government not relying on the system that's existed to test the conflict of rights that's existed for 20 years? Cabinet Secretary. I don't think it could be any clearer that for the first time we would be going into uncharted territory where there'd be new grounds of appeal for the accused on the basis of um, pro prosecution grounds. And I think we all in this Parliament uh, at various points um, in, our, in our tenure have defended uh, the rights of uh, prosecutors, uh, not least um, the Lord Advocate. But in terms of just trying to um, come to a conclusion, President Officer, and give uh, some reassurances uh, to Parliament, is that uh, what we are trying to do here is mitigate the risk of a case being deserted when a decision to prosecution um, is challenged uh, and which in turn may have a negative impact um, on the rights of victims. Uh, this, uh, I believe, is fair and proportionate uh, balance between giving the prosecutor an opportunity uh, to remedy a, a breach of UNCRC requirements, but that has, there are clear limits to that, and it is in a clear, certain and transparent way that will ensure consistency of practice and, crucially, it retains the court's ultimate uh, judicial uh, discretion in granting effective, just, appropriate remedy uh, when there is a breach. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 34 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. A member should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment 34 in the name of Natalie Dawn is yes, 62, uh, no, 48. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore uh, agreed. Call Amendment 84 in the name of Ruth Maguire. Already debated with Amendment 48. Ruth Maguire to move or not move? Not move, presiding officer. The member does not wish to move that amendment. Um, I call Amendment 85 in the name of Martin Whitfield. Already amend, uh, debated with Amendment uh, 80. Martin Whitfield to move or not move? Moved. Not moved. Uh, I call Amendment 86 in the name of Martin Whitfield. Already debated with Amendment 80. Martin Whitfield to move or not, not moved. moved. The amendment is not moved. That takes us to Group 15, Resources for Implementation of the Act. I call Amendment 35 in the name of Ros McCall, grouped with Amendments 87, 88 and 89. Ros McCall to move Amendment uh, 35 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Ms McCall. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'll be speaking to Amendment 35, um, obviously. Um, amendment 35 is another amendment highlighting the need for review and report to Parliament on the progress and processes of the enactment of the Bill. As I highlighted at the outset in remarks that I made on Ruth Maguire's um, amendment, I fundamentally believe that we must continue to assess this process for the changes that are before us. Not only to assess how this is working in practice, but how it, these changes will affect victims' rights and experiences, how the rights of all children involved in hearing and criminal proceedings are affected, and how changes to legislation affect other children that may be on the peripheral, but are equally affected by these legislative changes. Concerns over the implementation of the processes needed to ensure this works on the ground have still not been answered by the Scottish Government. And with Scottish Women's Aid and Victim Support Scotland continually seeking assurances that victims will not have their current rights eroded by the changes. Victim Support Scotland's brief for the debate today puts it more eloquently than I can, and I'll refer to them again. Throughout the procession of the Bill through Parliament, we have identified a significant lack of information and data relating to victims' experiences of the children's hearing system and cases' outcomes for victims. To better understand the system's ability to successfully manage cases involving offending behaviour and victims' experiences, it's vital that this information is collated, reported and reviewed by government. This will ensure that the government are able to appropriately respond to any gaps identified and issues surrounding victims' rights. We believe it's vital that the victims' experience of the system are understood and responded to so that any impact on the fulfilment of victims' rights is clearly identified. And on that basis, I urge members to support this amendment and the other amendments in the group. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Pam Duncan Glancy to speak to Amendment 87 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the key concerns highlighted in briefings, in evidence and in engagement on this bill is that the system in its totality, social work, secure care, justice, advocacy and so on, as it is currently resourced in terms of funding, staff, numbers, support and training, does not have the capacity to do what the bill aims to do and in fact may actually set back progress that has been made. And whilst finance is important, it is not the sole concern. Social Work Scotland said that they, and I quote, would emphasise the importance of these changes being fully funded with equal consideration to the wider staffing needs and capacity of the sector to manage further change, including, as already highlighted, the sequencing of any changes resulting from the bill. They go on to say that without considering capacity like this, the bill, and I quote, will not achieve its purpose and risks further placing pressure and stress on an already stretched workforce, impacting further on recruitment and retention and capacity to meet the goals of the promise to which we adhere. I was disappointed, therefore, that the Government did not support our amendments earlier on joined up working and multi-agency approaches, which would have put on the face of the Bill an intention of the Government's direction, which is that all of these systems must be in place and one would assume the Government would then support it. Furthermore, President Officer, the timescales that young people in the system are, are waiting already to be processed are worrying, and the target recruitment number for panel members has not yet been met. To expand the number of young people entering the system will exacerbate those issues and likely leave more children to wait more time to be processed and supported through the system. The Mackey Review made clear recommendations on the importance of young people having consistency of panel members and chairs. That needs capacity and more members. And we encouraged the government to ensure that these recommendations were met before they moved forward with the bill. But they haven't yet, ignoring, I think, the principle that sequencing in legislation is really important. In addition, the committee heard from Social Work Scotland that the system is not only overstretched by a lack of capacity and vacancy, but also an increasing absence rates within the system over each of the last three years, going from 62.5% of social workers having sickness absence in 2021 to 83% in 2023. There is, also no, there is no specific provision in the Bill to address these issues, and Scottish Labour are deeply concerned that without that, young people could not get the support they need, and thus the benefit of placement in secure care. It is worth noting that young people in secure care told the committee themselves that consistent social work support is crucial, but that they regularly get several different workers, one accounting that they would had eight social workers in eight years, which is not conducive to the promotion of welfare or rights of children and young people. 
Social workers and staff working for care and for the care of children and young people are working day and night, and I want to put on the record my thanks to them now. We owe it to them, I believe, and to the other staff in the system and to children in it to sequence change properly and to resource it accordingly. Indeed, we heard a moment ago, um, a while ago, about the need for flexibility and capacity in the system to ensure the co-branding principles can be maintained on the provision of um, children and young people in secure units. That capacity is not there yet, and we need to ensure that it is. That is why my Amendment 88 seeks to prevent commencement of the Bill until the Government publish a report introduced by Amendment 87, which confirms that there is sufficient capacity across the system to meet the requirements of the Bill. I believe this would have the effect of ensuring that capacity was in the system to do this properly, or at the very least, it would encourage decision makers keen to commence the Act to take swifter action to do so. Amendment 89 similarly seeks to delay commencement, but only until the Government is able to confirm to Parliament via a report that there are sufficient panel members to meet the provisions. President officer, I think this is the least that should be in place, and I would hope that if the Government do not support 88, I do hope they will, but if they do not, they, they will at least support 89 and 87. In short, presiding officer, it is my view that amendments, particularly 88 and 89 in this group, are necessary to ensure the system and the staff in it are sufficiently supported and resourced to meet the demands that will be placed on it, and, crucially, that the young people who are in it now and who may come into it after the passage of the Bill enjoy the goals of the promise, the promise of a system that supports the voices of children with the time and capacity to involve them in decisions about their care, and that ensures the scaffolding that supports children, families and the workforce to keep the promise is there to do that. On that basis, President Officer, I hope members will support the amendments in this group. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Willie Rennie. Financing and resources have been the most contentious issues, I would say, through the process of this bill. The Minister was, was really heavily criticised by the Finance Committee and the Education Committee for the inadequacies in the original financial memorandum. And I would encourage, if members have time, to go back and look at the, the evidence given by social workers. And they were really conflicted by this. They really supported the promise. They supported this bill. They wanted it to happen. But they know the state of their departments. They know the shortage they have of staff. What Pam Duncan Glancy talked about in terms of the turnover of social workers for young people, which it seems to be never-ending. So they're deeply concerned that this bill will pass, no real mon more money will come, and they will be left to pick up the pieces and try to patch things together. So there is a, there's a deep concern and anxiety out there that this bill won't be properly funded. So I hope, now the, I don't think the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister are here today, but I hope they're listening to the assurances that the Minister is about to give to us, because she gave us to them in the committee. She said the money will be forthcoming. She said that it will be properly funded, resourced, sequenced. It will all be working effectively. So I hope she has the support and approval of all our Cabinet colleagues to make sure that that happens, because lots of people are watching, not just the social workers who are finding it really difficult to cope with the system, but looked after children. Now, we met the looked after children recently um, through um, Who Cares Scotland, and they've done a brilliant job in bringing people together who have been through the system. And they're exasperated. They are frustrated. They feel that nothing really has happened, and they want action to progress. Now, this bill gives us an opportunity to progress things, but only if it's funded properly. So I hope the money will be forthcoming and we don't let these young people down. We'll be watching very closely, but I don't want to put any barriers in the way to making this bill happen. So I don't agree with Pam Duncan Glancy's mechanisms. I'm glad that she's raised these amendments today, uh, but we won't be supporting 88 and 89. We will be supporting 87. It is important to flush out this debate, to have it properly authorised and supported by the Cabinet so they fully understand the anxieties that are felt across the system, so that the money is forthcoming and we do not let young people down. Yes, certainly. John Swinney. Hey, I am grateful to Mr Rennie for giving weight. I, I, I follow a lot of his argument and I understand where he is coming from, but can I establish the link also with his, inter with his comments about Somerset Council? Because it is actually a lot of these reforms require changes of attitudes as well as the money being in place. And I think it's right to press about resources. 
but it's also right for Parliament to press about changes in attitudes within public authorities to undertake the reforms that he correctly cited in Somerset, but which require to be undertaken to deliver the promise in its entirety. Willie Rennie. I, I fully accept what John Swinney is saying. It requires a whole system change, a culture change, an attitude from all the different stakeholders and contributors to it. But the history of this isn't a good one. And I've given the evidence about the state of social work departments and how difficult they are finding it just to cope. I've had personal experience myself of looked after children who have one social worker after another for years on end. And then we end up with a crisis and they're taken into secure care. That's not the way to treat young people. And that's why we need the resource to be forthcoming. So accept the point. It's not just about money. It's about culture as well. But money is pretty important. Thank you. And I call the minister. Thank you, President Officer. This group of amendments is founded in members' understandable interests in ensuring that the right resources will be in place to support the Bill. This Bill proposes the displacement of more cases to children's systems, services and settings, and members are right to seek clarity that those mechanisms will be ready to deliver, both from initial commencement and on an ongoing basis. However, I am concerned not to draw agencies' resource and attention away from substantive planning and preparation, instead diverting it too far towards reporting, especially when that proposed reporting is either too broadly drawn or unduly prescriptive, or when the proposed reporting intervals are either so premature or so re retrospective. I have already stated to Parliament that we will not commence these provisions until I have assurances that all key delivery agencies are ready, and I am already in conversations around this and have been throughout the process of this bill. I am Duncan Glancy. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. And, and I, I get the point about reporting, but the amendment I brought at stage two did not include a reporting mechanism. The amendment I brought at stage two said, um, asked that the, the bill not be commenced until the system was up and, up, uh, up and running and had capacity. And when, when the Minister and I discussed this between stage two and stage three, there was a discussion about whether a report to establish whether the capacity was necessary. So if the Minister has another mechanism to which she could establish herself whether the capacity is in the system that doesn't require a report, I'd be interested to hear it. Minister. Thank you. Pam Duncan Glancy is right to draw on some of our conversations between stage two and stage three. Um, I have perhaps some um, different opinion on the definition of system readiness or capacity, but I would also say that I think the member has been a little bit hasty um, in terms of the, the amendments at play here. So if I could continue. Firstly, to Ros McCall's Amendment 35, requiring a report to be laid in Parliament a year after royal assent as to whether sufficient resources were in place, it is already clear that there will be provisions in this bill that will not be commenced until well after the first anniversary of royal assent. That reality renders this particular amendment redundant. There are also issues with the identified reporting heads in this amendment, and I will take a moment to describe why those problems are uh, sorry, why those proposals are problematic, because the point also applies to Pam Duncan Glancy's Amendment 89. On secure care, there is already daily reporting on occupancy rates for each centre. A retrospective report on occupancy rates would add no value to forward planning. More appropriate and detailed reporting, planning and projection, act, uh, sorry, planning and projection activity already happens. On children's social work staff numbers, that's, it's not a reliable illustration of professional support capacity for children's hearing decisions. It's for an entire local authority with important contributions from the third sector and others to implement hearing decisions. This amendment would not capture the inf information that it clearly intends. However, I am acutely aware of the challenges that committee members heard, and as I updated the committee, um, there is a whole host of work underway to improve this situation. On children's panel numbers, there are variations in individual panel member availability, which also fluctuate for individuals from time to time. There are also significant prevailing differences in local requirements as to panel numbers. Both factors directly affect the actual caseload processing capacity among local areas. So you could have a huge number of panel members, but dependent on that, those panel members' availability, that doesn't necessarily mean that the system is ready. So we need to look at the, the, the detail, finer detail. An aggregate report on total national panel numbers, looking backwards, would not assist Parliament. Instead, if I could just make progress, 
Instead, prospective projections which have practical management information utility for the National Convener and CHS are already in place. I will take the in uh, intervention. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention, and that is why I think um, Amendment 88, if I am right on my numbering, um, sets out that it is about the capacity within the panel system rather than specifically the numbers. Minister. I thank the member for that intervention, and I will get on to Amendment 88 in just a second. Amendment 87 from Pam Duncan Glancy would entail the compilation of material from a range of sources directly engaged in preparing for the commencement and implementation of the Bill. The amendment is not strictly required given our implementation planning and our usual commitment to post-commencement review. But that said, I acknowledge the member's sincere interest in this area and I note the absence of unduly broad or inappropriately prescriptive elements from this amendment, so I will therefore support Amendment 87. Turning to Amendment 88, there are a number of structural, practical and scope difficulties. Linking the commencement of legislation to a retrospective report so soon after royal assent, particularly without either defining resources or sufficiency, are in my view inappropriate preconditions. There will be a very limited value in publishing a report within, six, within the six-month limit in the amendment about conditions and capacity during that period. In respect of secure care, there should be no capacity concerns because our 16-bed funding intervention is already in place with funding agreed and confirmed. On children's hearings, partners in our implementation and resourcing group tell us that the relevant expansion provisions should not be commenced until late 25-26. So a report laid here in, say, December 24 could refer to a period that is actually more than a year before some provisions planned commencement date. That would not reveal anything useful to Parliament about current relevant resources or sufficiency. As to the issues with scope, the amendment refers to the children's hearing system. I note that the system extends not only to SCRA, CHS and local authorities. The report would also need to include report, reporting on safeguarders, advocacy workers, solicitors and counsel, police, cops, courts and the full sweep of local authority services and third sector provision accessible by children, as well as reporting on health services. This would be an onerous, unjustifiable undertaking, so I cannot support the amendment. Turning to Amendment 89, there are undoubted challenges intrinsic to the sheer scale of the children's panels element of the children's hearing system. And I have met with Children's Hearing Scotland Chair and Chief Executive in the past month, and I will continue to meet with them before commencement. It is not a current or retrospective national snapshot, as proposed by the amendment, that is required. What is needed and what will be in place is an informed and evidence-based series of forward projections looking forward to potential commencement dates. On a rolling basis, remedial recruitment and retention actions that strengthen the panel are required in preparation for these reforms, and we will support the National Convener and Children's Hearing Scotland in that. As I observed at stage two, we also risk interfering with the vital independence of the National Convener of Children's Hearing Scotland. It is that convener's independent statutory role to determine how to resource children's panels as set out in the 2011 Act. For those reasons, I cannot support the amendment, but I am happy to update Parliament regularly on these issues. Thank you. And I call on Rose McCall to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 35. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I note the points that have been made. Um, I actually echo the, the points that have been put across by Pam Duncan Glancy and Willie Rennie um, on the concerns on upscaling, financing, um, resourcing, um, and the pressure that a lot of our systems, including staff, um, the children's hearing system, social, um, social work, uh, the pressures that they are all under. And I know that needs to come together properly funded, and I accept wholeheartedly that there needs to be a, a change in culture. Um, I hear the, the Minister's uh, comments uh, on the amendment, and uh, whilst I understand that certain parts will be after the first year, the amendment does include additional years after that. And I do think this is an important part where we have information coming back to Parliament, and I am going to press the amendment. And I thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And the question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. Graeme Day, point of order. Brown officer, uh, my app didn't connect. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr Day. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 35 in the name of Ros McCall is yes 44, no 68. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 87 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with amendment 35. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? No. The question is that amendment 87 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Can I just confirm, are we all agreed? The amendment is agreed. I call amendment 36 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 34. Cabinet Secretary to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 36 in the name of Natalie Don is yes 64, no 46. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 88 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with amendment 35. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? It move, President Officer. The question is that amendment 88 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <coughs> Point of order, Neil Gray. Apologies, President Officer, I couldn't get it to the platform. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr Gray. We'll ensure that's recorded.
The result of the vote on amendment number 88 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes 44, no 67. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 89 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with amendment 35. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move. Move. The question is that amendment 89 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 89 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes 43, no 69. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 37 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 28. Minister to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 90 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 41. Russell Finlay to move or not move? Not moved. I call amendments 91, 92, 93, 94, 95 and 96, all in the name of Russell Finlay and all previously debated. And I ask Mr Finlay if he intends to move amendments 91 to 96. Not moved. Russell Finlay has indicated that he will not be moving amendments 91 to 96. It would be helpful if any member who wishes to move any amendments, 91 to 96, could indicate now. No member has indicated that they wish to do so, so I confirm for the record that the following amendments in the name of Russell Finlay are not moved, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95 and 96. And I call Amendment 38 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 25. Minister to move. Moved. Thank you. And the question is that Amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 97 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 41. Russell Finlay to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 39 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 34, Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The 
The result of the vote on amendment number 39 in the name of Natalie Don is yes 79, no 32. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And that ends consideration of amendments. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12948 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak on the motion, and the question is that motion 12948 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12949 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on timetabling of a bill at stage one. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Once again, thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 12949 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. And as there are no further questions to be put as a result of today's business, I close this meeting.